Welcome everyone. With your permission, I'm going to take my mask out. Otherwise, it will not be easy for me to welcome you to this fifth international Bez Mala Mortopit meeting. Though uh, I have seen in the slides that it's going to be the first virtual meeting. We don't like virtual meetings. We're aware of it. We would like to have you here in Bez Mailem, and we would have liked to host you here. But I'm sure that it will be as good as the older meetings that we had in the university. This uh, evening here in Istanbul and morning in the States and afternoon in Italy, we will be hearing from the experts how to move forward with different cases. And I'm happy to welcome you once more to Besma Lam in Istanbul and our virtual meeting and hope you're a fruitful meeting. And I know that there will be lots of questions coming up to you and you will be using the chat um, facilities to ask your questions. And now I leave the podium to my colleagues. But before that, I want to thank every uh, faculty of my orthopedics division, which is one of the best divisions in the School of Medicine in Bezma Lem, which has become the uh, youngest universities with best achievement in uh, science and education. And I'm proud to be in welcoming you once more to this meeting and stay safe. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate Professor Kazancıoğlu. And uh, welcome to our guests. I would like to uh, go on with Turkish with your permission, because uh, most of our uh, participants are Turkish and we will then uh, switch to the English with, your, with, with their permission. Uh, Değerli arkadaşlar, sayın meslektaşlarımız, sayın hocalarımız, beşinci uluslararası hale gelen Bezmalem Ortopedi toplantısına hoş geldiniz diyorum. Yani bu tabii hiç beklemediğimiz, geçen sene bir düşündüğümüz zaman hiç beklemediğimiz, ummadığımız bir toplantı formatında oluyor şu anda. Ama biz buna maalesef çok alıştık. Avantajlarını da gördük bunların. Ee, bu sene önümüzde iki tane alternatif vardı. Ya alıştığımız tarzdaki toplantıyı e, pas geçirecektik ya da bir şekilde e, bir online'da olsa bir toplantı yapacaktık. Dolayısıyla e, topluca arkadaşlarımızın da önerisiyle bu sene e, böyle yarım günlük, akşamlık, bir akşamlık bir toplantı yapalım kararı verdik. Burada sağ olsunlar her zaman bizi destekleyen, bizimle birlikte olan, bilimsel desteklerini bizlere esirgemeyen hocalarımız yine buradalar. Şimdi programı görüyorsunuz. Her birinizin elinize çeşitli yollardan ulaştı. Şu anda açılış dönemindeyiz. Ondan sonra arkasından Kerem Hoca'ya ben moderatörlüğü vereceğim. Kerem Hoca Profesör Zukerman'ı takdim edecek ve arkasından Profesör Zukerman şeyi anlatacak. Şu, hemen şuraya geçeyim. E, omuz cerrahisi ile ilgili, genç hastalardaki omuz cerrahisi ile ilgili tecrübelerini aktaracak. Profesör Zak Zakırman e, New York Üniversitesi'nde e, NIU'nun Langen Health Hastanesi'nde çalışıyor. Ama aynı zamanda e, ciddi anlamda e, eğitimsel tecrübesi var. Hem lisans eğitimi hem de e, ortopedi ve aynı zamanda e, artoplasti ve omuz cerrahisi tecrübesi var. E, sağ olsunlar daha önceden de bize burada destek vermişlerdi İstanbul'da. E, bugün de bizimle birlikteler. E, Francesco Benazzo e, arkadaşımız diyeceğim. Sağ olsun yine bizi kırmadı. E, o da çok yoğun. Programı hakikaten çok yoğun online eğitimler konusunda. Ee, Pavia Üniversitesi'nde e, özellikle unikompartmental diz protezi, total diz protezi, patellofemoral eklem artoplastisi ve revizyon cerrahisi ile alakalı hakikaten hem tecrübeleri çok yoğun 
hem de onunla ilgili çalışmaları ve kendi tekniklerini de e, sağ olsunlar bizlere aktardılar. Burada da e, yine deneyimlerinden faydalanacağız kendilerini. Teşekkür ediyorum Franco'ya. Son olarak Sayın Cevat Par bizi hepiniz tanıyorsunuz. Şimdi açılışta o da olacaktı. Fakat şu anda Amerika'da başka bir toplantıda aynı anda olmak zorunda olduğundan biz de e, aflarını dilediler. Ben de sizlere aktarıyorum e, bu problemi. E, i̇şte Parvizi tanıtmaya gerek var mı bilmiyorum ama yani özellikle diz ve kalça artroplastisinde ondan sonra periprostetik enf eklem enfeksiyonunun tanımlanmasında ve tedavisinde hakikaten kuralları koyan insan oldu. E, ve kalça koruyucu cerrahi konusunda da e, mini open cerrahinin tanımlanmasını kendisine borçluyuz. E, son konuşmacı olarak biraz programda bir ufak bir değişiklik yaptık. Son konuşmacı olarak kendisi bizlere katılacaklar. E, i̇yi bir toplantı olması dileğiyle hepinize teşekkür ediyorum. Bizleri takip ettiğiniz için e, ve şey, e, toplantıyı bilimsel oturum başlatmak üzere mikrofonu Kerem Hoca'ya takdim etmek istiyorum. Şunu kapatayım. Okay. Uh, welcome again. Good morning. Good morning for uh, USA. Good afternoon for Italy. And good evening for Turkey. Uh, welcome to our fifth Beyaz Malam Orthopedic Meeting. Uh, today our webinar topic is, as, as you know, arthroplasty options in young osteoarthritic patients. And we are going to start with the uh, shoulder session. And our first uh, international faculty is Dr. Joseph Zuckerman from New York University Langone Health Hospital. And everyone knows him very well. Uh, he don't need any introduction. And he was also our guest lecturer last year in our fourth uh, meeting. And this is again a great honor uh, to have him in our this webinar. And I would like to give a, a brief information about the meeting. The participants are gonna follow uh, the webinar from our YouTube channel. So you can ask and write your questions on the uh, chat box and we will get and discuss all of them uh, after the uh, end of at the end of this session now i would like to invite professor zuckerman uh, for his talk please please joseph the screen is yours okay thank, thank you. you thank you very much you can see the screen and you can hear me okay yes yes okay so first of all Uh, I want to thank our host for inviting me to uh, participate in this meeting. Uh, as noted, I was in Turkey in Istanbul last year, and it was a absolutely terrific meeting. I was very pleased to be there. So when I was asked to participate in the virtual uh, meeting this year, of course, I was wanted to say yes. And even though today is my wife's birthday, all right, I made an exception uh, for her from her, all right, because I really wanted to participate. I think this is a terrific meeting and a terrific group. So I thank you for inviting me. So as you know, the topic is arthroplasty options in the young patient with glenohumeral arthritis. Uh, arthritis in general, but I'm gonna address the issue of glenohumeral arthritis. Th these are, let's have to, there we go, okay. These are my uh, disclosures. Most important is the fact that I, uh, I am a designer for a shoulder arthroplasty system, uh, and that is uh, certainly a, a topic of the talk. So but, uh, let's just take a step back and look at the goals of arthroplasty in the young patient with glenohumeral arthritis. Uh, And really, there's not much difference between the, the young patient with glenohumeral arthritis and any patient with glenohumeral arthritis. The goals of treatment are achieve pain relief, secure fixation of the implants. We want to be able to reproduce the anatomy of the glenohumeral articulation. And we have a greater appreciation for that now with the uh, recognition that uh, replication of anatomy will achieve 
improved outcomes. We know that, but now we have to achieve it. And that means we want a bal balanced and centered articulation. Patients want their function restored. And also ultimately, we want to have the optimal long-term survival of the implant. Now, I just emphasize again, we're going to focus on glenohumeral osteoarthritis. We're excluding inflammatory arthritis and post-traumatic arthritis. So there are a number of questions we can answer when it comes to this topic. The first is, what do, what do we do on the humeral side? Which implant is the preferred implant? There are a lot of options out there. Standard stems, short stems, even shorter stem, stem stemless. And there are some surgeons that prefer a resurfacing option. A major question that's often debated is, should the glenoid be resurfaced in young patients? Uh, we'll talk more about that later. And if you do uh, resurface the glenoid, should it be a biologic uh, resurfacing or uh, should you resurface it with an implant? If you decide to resurface the glenoid with an implant, what type of implant is preferred? The options include all polyethylene glenoids, which has the greatest experience uh, over the uh, longest period of time, hybrid implants, which rely on a combination of cemented and non-cemented fixation. And there are some non-cemented options out there. And when it, within the context on the glenoid side, oftentimes you encounter significant glenoid erosion. In that particular case, is there a role for bone grafting in these patients or are the use of augmented implants preferable? And because these are young patients, are there options available with respect to the materials we use that may enhance the longevity of the implant? All these questions that we're gonna to try and to address today to some degree. Now, the answers that we're gonna provide you know, is, is not definitive. Right, because the evidence that's out there is not going to provide uh, answers to how what is the best treatment option. The treatment in these patients, uh, young patients with glenohumeral arthritis, in my opinion, is currently driven primarily by the individual surgeon's preference. I mean, what's my experience? Tell me. I integrate what's out there in the literature, but it's really my preference and my assessment of what I think is the most effective approach, and that's going to be that way until better evidence is available. So I'll say, from the out, I'll say from the outset that this is my position in, in this particular patient population, that my strong preference is to resurface the glenoid with an implant in all cases, except when the glenoid is completely uninvolved, which in my experience is a very unusual situation. And for me, the improved outcomes that, that can be achieved with a, by resurfacing the glenoid exceeds the concerns about the implant longevity. Most people would say, can't, can't resurface the glenoid because it's going to, when it loosens, you'll have less options later on. Well, I think we do have not only better outcomes in terms of implant survival, but we have better options later, uh, as we progress uh, uh, with new implants that are available in the revision, revision situation. So let's focus on the humeral side first. If you believe that bone preservation is essential, then you're clearly going to uh, select the least invasive humeral component that can be utilized the implant that removes the least amount of bone. And you see the options here, a standard lathe implant, a shorter or short stem implant, uh, and there are even shorter ones than that, a stemless implant, and of course, a resurfacing implant. And the reason I put a question mark there is because to me, I don't want to use a humeral component that interferes with my, my ability to do the most, provide the most effective glenoid component placement. So although there are, there are experienced surgeons out there who can do a resurfacing on the humeral side and implant the glenoid, when, whenever I've been trying to achieve that, I, I have generally felt that it compromises my ability to uh, insert the glenoid properly. Now, not all short stems are the same. There are different designs with respect to the length, the degree of metaphyseal fill, the curve of the proximal portion of the stem, as you can see some examples here. Now, there's a lot of data that's becoming available. And as more and more of it becomes available, we'll have a better idea whether or not there is an optimal design for longevity on the humeral side when it comes to short stems. Now, there are many stemless options available as well, a few of which are, are represented here. Here, there are many options, but much less data available right at this time. But early results are, are seem to uh, indicate that stemless options can be as effective as other humeral sided options. And this is some data from the United States over the last six, six years or so. 
in which you see the use of short stem components and stemless components are increasing. And now they account for, at least in 2019, over 40% of the humeral implants that are inserted. So clearly this is the direction that uh, surgeons are going in, but as, as is often the case, the data lags behind the uh, preferences of the surgeons. There are some concerns on the humeral side in these young patients. First of all, we've learned that the implant geometry and technique can result in stress shielding. Some of the early uh, short stem components because of the in, in, uh, significant metaphyseal fill uh, caused problems with stress shielding, which was the problem that was trying to be avoided with standard stem implants. Now, fortunately, th those problems seem to be uh, uh, corrected, but you always have to look at that issue with any new implant that's utilized. The humeral implant has to allow us to reproduce proximal humeral anatomy. The humeral head does not sit uh, centrally on the, uh, in respect to the humeral shaft. It's posteriorly and medially displaced. So our ability to reproduce the humeral anatomy and align the, the articular surface with the metaphysis is very important. And the implant should allow us to do that. You have to maintain the integrity of the, of the rotator cuff. Whatever you do on the humeral side has to maintain the security of the uh, insertion of the rotator cuff superiorly and posteriorly, and of course, anteriorly with the subscapularis repair. And you have to have an implant that's versatile enough to allow appropriate soft tissue balancing. The, if you can't balance the humerus on the glenoid, if there's eccentric loading of the glenoid, then that will lead to early failure of the glenoid component. And you can only do that through proper soft tissue technique and having the implants available to allow that balancing to occur. And as I pointed out before, if you're resurfacing the glenoid with a resurfacing component, you know, my preference is I will not use an implant that compromises my ability to get proper glenoid exposure and to insert the glenoid component. Now, for me on the humeral side, I have moved to more and more short stem components and stemless components, such that when faced with you know, the young patient with osteoarthritis, right, I, will, I generally will utilize a stemless component now that I have it available and I like the implants that i am uh, that I'm been using. Now, there are concerns about the glenoid side of these young patients. The first thing you have to do in evaluating the glenoid is understand the pattern of the generation and where. Everybody is familiar with the fact that the most common uh, uh, nature of erosion is increased posterior erosion, the so-called uh, B2 glenoid, asymmetric posterior wear, increased retroversion of the glenoid. That's the most common deformity, but it's not the only deformity. So understanding the uh, anatomy of the glenoid is very important. The goal should be to restore near anatomic version. Now, what is anatomic version of the glenoid? Probably in that zero to five degrees of retroversion category uh, for most people. Now, doing that for me requires, uh, now is very, is very benefited by preoperative planning and the ability to use intraoperative navigation. You know, for, for over 30 years, I did shoulder replacements uh, with the standard technique, you know, using anatomic landmarks during the surgery to implant the glenoid component. But now in the last, three years, I've moved towards preoperative planning and intraoperative navigation. And I will tell you with all humility, it has made me a better shoulder orthoplasty surgeon because now I have a sense of more, more of a sense of exactly what I'm doing uh, uh, during the operation with respect to the glenoid side. And on the glenoid, you also have to decide it, is the wear pattern correctable with an anatomic total shoulder orthoplasty. You will see the occasional patient, young patient that has such severe deformity that you know, the chance, the ability to balance the articulation, right, is, is so low, you may have to consider a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. I'm not, that's an unusual situation. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but you have to evaluate preoperatively whether correcting the deformity is possible. And as I noted before, centralizing your humeral head to balance the forces is included. And in resurfacing the glenoid with an implant, you have to decide what method of fixation? You know, is it going to be all cemented versus hybrid versus non-cemented? So for me, approaching the glenoid requires an extensive preoperative radiographic assessment to understand the deformity. You know, I would say probably 15 years ago or more, I decided I needed a CT scan on every patient I was going to do a shoulder arthroplasty on. 
uh, previous to that time, I would get it selectively. And I used to believe that a good axillary review would give me the information that I needed. But as I got more and more CT scans, I, it really made me realize that, that you can't, the standard radiographs will not give you an appreciation of glenoid anatomy like CT scans. And as the CT scans have gotten better with three-dimensional reconstructions, right, it really has only enhanced the ability to recognize and define the deformity. And as I noted, I'm utilizing pre-op planning and intraoperative navigation to optimize placement. Now, the other aspect of my approach is in the face of glenoid deformity, posterior wear, I will have a very low threshold to utilize an augmented component to correct the wear pattern and minimize the re bone reaming that I have to do. In other words, I wanna preserve as much bone on the glenoid side as possible. And that's true in all the cases I do, but it's particularly true in young patients because to me, the glenoid represents very valuable real estate. You know, in New York City, it's Park Avenue. I'm sure there's the a, a analogous a street in Istanbul, right, that has the same uh, high value real estate. So I wanna preserve everything I can on the glenoid side. And I utilize a hybrid component at this time because I think that will give me lo better long-term fixation. However, if I had a non-cemented component with a, a successful track record, in these patients, I would certainly utilize a non-cemented component. So just a word about augmented glenoids. Uh, Posterior augmented glenoids are beneficial because it decreases the amount of reaming that's necessary. For me, it eliminates the need for bone grafting. And you know, I don't bone graft glenoids in anatomic replacement uh, anymore. My experience with that has been unsuccessful. It's a technical challenge. And sometimes you can be technically successful only to find the bone graft resorbed and have problems within two to three years. And I think that augmented glenoids have made it easier for me to rebalance the joint forces and achieve that centralized balance articulation that's necessary. And there are a, a variety of different augmented implants available that can be utilized. So I think the correction of deformity on the glenoid is more easily and consistently accomplished with augmented glenoids rather than bone grafts. Now, uh, uh, since this is about arthroplasty, I will also mention that throughout my whole career, right, I've done uh, hip replacement and knee replacements, and I continue to do so. And certainly, those when you uh, those of you performing hip and knee replacements know that on the acetabular side with significant bone loss, or on the tibial side in knee replacements, you know we've gone from bone grafting to replacing uh, bone de bony deficiencies with augments with, with prostheses, and it's been proved to be much more successful than the bone grafts. And I think the same thing is true. On the, um, on the, uh, in the shoulder on the glenoid side. So I'm taking the lessons that I learned on hip and knee replacements and applying them to the glenoid. This is what I mean by minimizing bone loss because in the situation you see he here on the left, that's asymmetric posterior wear. Now, if I, if I utilize off axis reaming right, and an augmented glenoid, look at the minimum amount of bone that I'm removing uh, in the middle, in the middle section, as opposed to if I try to flatten the glenoid and put a standard implant, I'd be removing much more bone. And on the glenoid side, that's much less attractive. In addition, you can see from this this depiction in a uh, a uh, representation of a posterior eroded glenoid, which is the second image from the left. If I flatten the glenoid and use a standard implant, not only have I removed bone, but I've medialized the joint line which decreases the tension on the rotator cuff. So medializing the joint line is biomechanically disadvantageous for the soft tissues, as opposed to maintaining a lateralized joint line and using an augmented implant. So let me show you a few examples. So this is a 41 year old uh, uh, carpenter who works for the sanitation department in New York. And as you can see, the significant uh, flattening of the humeral head, inferior osteophyte formation, and on the axillary view, you can see some degree of posterior subluxation, although not excessive, right? This is the CAT scan, which provides a, a much greater depiction of the posterior erosion. I'm just gonna go back to the previous slide. See on the axillary view, you don't really have the appreciation for the degree of uh, posterior erosion that is evident on the axillary view. And the three-dimensional reconstructions only makes it even more, more uh, evident. So in this particular 
uh, patient with significant glenoid erosion, right? He was reconstructed using a 16 degree augmented glenoid. And as you can see in the x-ray on the right, the augmented glenoid is there. We've been able to recentralize and rebalance the joint. Or in this particular patient, a 21 year old who is treated for leukemia and develops extensive osteonecrosis of the humeral head with collapse. And you look at the glenoid there and you see there's probably some preserved articular cartilage. And I would not disagree with anyone who decided to just do a humeral head replacement, just a humeral uh, sided operation in this particular patient. However, at the time of surgery, there was more extensive glenoid damage than was evident from the x-ray. And so in this case, she also re underwent a uh, complete shoulder, shoulder replacement. This is another young patient who uh, underwent a thermal capsulography with use of an intraarticular pain pump. Uh, you may remember that that at some point was very popular. We thought we could correct uh, glenohumeral instability with a thermal capsulography. And for patient comfort, we use these uh, intraarticular uh, lidocaine pumps uh, with different anesthetics. And it led to chondrolysis and uh, degeneration of the joint. So this, this is a young patient. Once again, uh, the good news here is that there's minimal asymmetric glenoid erosion. So a standard, a standard implant was utilized and he's now 10 years post-op. Now these cases were done before I had access to uh, uh, preoperative planning and intraoperative navigation, right? So here's a 42-year-old here's a female who, I, I, you can call this glenohumeral arthritis, although I think there may be an inflammatory component. Uh, and uh, uh, because of the x-ray appearance, although she underwent a complete rheumatologic workup that was negative. And you also see on the ashlar view that she does have a uh, osochromial uh, on the, uh, in evident, but it was not mobile, it was stable, so that was not addressed. So in this particular patient, right, you can see the CAT scan here, you know, some erosive changes. And here's the, with the preoperative planning. We decided what implant to use, where to place it, in this case, we put it in three degrees of retroversion, so we can put it uh, the uh, central pe central portion of the implant right down the glenoid vault. And because of her age and the availability uh, of stemless implants, we utilize the stemless here to remove a minimal amount of bone uh, in this particular situation. For a 46-year-old here with more significant changes, extensive osteophyte formation, and a flattening of the head, more deformity as evident. And here, it was 15 to 70 degrees, 15 to 70 degrees of retroversion based upon measuring from Friedman's line, well documented on the uh, CT scan. Preoperative planning in this case, utilizing a 16 degree uh, augmented glenoid, uh, uh, orienting the position as well. In this case, we put it in zero degrees of version. Uh, and uh, postoperatively, here is the uh, uh, here, here are the x-rays. Once again, on the ashlar view, centralizing the uh, implant, uh, uh, the humeral head on the glenoid. So if you look at the literature on the different options that are out there, and, and uh, I, could, I could spend 40 minutes just reviewing the literature, but that's not uh, going to be particularly helpful, helpful for, uh, uh, for any of us. So uh, I want to show it some specific options that have been documented in the literature. This is the, a, uh, an outcomes report on the Riemann run shoulder arthroplasty that was popular, has been popularized by uh, Dr. Matson at the University of Washington in Seattle. And uh, basically this is a humeral head resurfacing in which uh, the glenoid is reamed uh, to a concave surface. These are in, in younger patients. In this case, the mean age was 56 years. And he had, has had very successful results with longer term follow-up of over 10 years. And you can see the simple shoulder test improved. There was only a 12% revision rate at 10 years, which is good, not wonderful, but it's good. The problem with this operation has been that nobody seems to be able to reproduce the results that Dr. Matson gets. Uh, there are a few people that train with him that seem to be able to do it, but in general, it's been difficult to reproduce this operation. Along those lines, biological resurfacing of the glenoid with uh, fasciolata graft, meniscus, right, which also became very popular some period of time, has not stood the test of time. The results have been relatively poor after a few years, and it is not a reliable operation. So I would say that biological resurfacing in general has, uh, has no longer has any enthusiasm for shoulder arthroplasty surgeons. 
Now, the use of surface replacement in the humeral head in young active patients has been popularized by Buddy Savoie at Tulane. He reported that his, his cases here, this is just the humeral resurfacing without the glenoid. Now, he did not treat any patients with a B2 glenoid or significant posterior subluxation, so it's a very limited, well-selected group. And he, of course, had, had excellent results uh, with, with this approach in a select subgroup of patients, young patients with, with uh, glenohumeral arthritis. Now, the question of are these patients better off with a hemiarthroplasty or a total shoulder replacement when, uh, for osteoarthritis? You know, this has gone, uh, this, uh, I think we were give, done a disservice to a certain extent many years ago when uh, Dr. Rockwood uh, published some results that said in, in patients with osteoarthritis, a hemiarthroplasty results, in other words, not resurfacing the glenoid, was comparable to a uh, total shoulder replacement, in other words, with a prosthetic resurfacing of the glenoid. Now, what they showed in, the, in these early articles was that there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups. However, in virtually every report, those that had a shoulder replacement, a, a resurfacing of the humeral head and the glenoid, always had superior results in, in terms of pain relief, functional improvement, and longevity. Whether it achieves statistical significance in some articles was in question. So if you look at this review, so that increased the enthusiasm that people had for hemiarthroplasty to treat osteoarthritis, particularly in younger patients. However, if you look at this review, which uh, is a small, small group of patients, right? Uh, and it's a randomized controlled trial, which you know is very uncommon in orthopedics. Uh, if you look at the 10 year survival, clearly there were significant differences between the hemiarthroplasty group and the total shoulder arthroplasty group. So uh, to me, articles like this and the sum total of the literature clearly pushes us towards resurfacing the glenoid as opposed to only doing a humeral-sided procedure, right? Now, the, the use of the stemless has gained popularity, and there are some reports out, uh, available that, say, that indicate that the stemless implants provide results comparable to the standard stemmed implants. So this is a report from the Nordic Arthroplasty Registry of over 700 stemless implants compared with over 4,000 standard implants with two and a half year follow-up and basically a very low revision rate for both stemless and the standard length implants, which basically you know, shows that the results are comparable and both equally successful. So this is, this is good support for the use of stemless implants. And I'm gonna say a word about uh, other biomaterials. Since this is a young patient population, there are some people that have supported the use of a humeral resurfacing with alternative biomaterials to decrease the potential for for glenoid, or gradual glenoid erosion over time, since that's the concern when you only resurface the humeral head and leave the glenoid intact. So the use of a pyrocarbon interpositional arthroplasty was utilized. Glenoid reaming was performed in patients, you know, to correct the deformity, correct the B2 glenoid. And as you can see, the, the results were really very, very unsuccessful. 10% required revision to a reverse because of uh, painful glenoid erosion. And there was no indication that this pyrocarbon material was at all protective against glenoid erosion. Now we reported our own results using the, the Equinox uh, implant system uh, last year. We looked at patients, younger patients, we, which we defined as 55 years or younger compared with uh, a matched cohort over the age of 55. And you can see we had a, a large number of patients over a thousand, uh, but of course it was only two year follow-up. And it was, uh, we, have, we found differences in active forward elevation, internal rotation in the older group. And the older group has slightly better uh, ASES, SPADI and UCLA scores. And although this, because of the large number of patients, it achieves statistical significance, functionally the difference, difference between a forward elevation of 145 degrees versus 141 degrees was not functionally significant. So uh, this, for me, this provides uh, reasonable data and support for the use of shoulder arthroplasty, resurfacing the glenoid and the humeral head in this challenging uh, patient population. So uh, in summary, right, this is my uh, bottom line for patients with glenohumeral osteoarthritis, young patients, right? For me, preserving bone on the humeral side is essential. Resurfacing the glenoid 
is essential uh, because uh, you're going to achieve better outcomes. An unresurfaced glenoid will not give you the same uh, uh, result in terms of pain relief and functional outcomes as it would, will be in, uh, if you resurface the glenoid. My goal is to preserve bone on the glenoid side as much as possible because there's not much bone there. Uh, so, and, you, and you're going to need it uh, later on as well. And how you implant the glenoid and achieve the fixation and how you balance the, the uh, joint is important for the long-term implant survival. And I'm going to use all available tools if possible. And in this patient population, which tends to be more active, the more you can have them modify their activities, uh, if they'll listen to you, I think it will further enhance the long-term survival of the implant. So for me, resurfacing the glenoid component with an implant in this patient population is preferable uh, and because it provides better outcomes than my concerns about the long-term survival of the implant on the glenoid side. I'd rather deal with a loose glenoid at eight or 10 years rather than progressive glenoid erosion because we've only resurfaced the glenoid side because as you lose more bone on the glenoid side, the options become more limited. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and, uh, and uh, uh, return the screen to our, uh, our uh, hosts. I think we have time for questions now. Okay. Thank you, Professor Zuckerman, for your excellent talk. So we have some questions. Uh, I would like to start from the first question. Uh, is there still a role for hemiarthroplasty uh, and biologic glenoid res resurfacing so, so, for, you, for your practice? Yeah. So I would say in my practice, the answer is no, right? Because through the years, I've, done, I've used different materials. I've, I've done... Uh, on the glenoid side, I've used capsular resurfacing by splitting the capsule. I've used uh, fasciolata or Achilles tendon uh, uh, allograft. And I've used you know, uh, meniscus that is you know, uh, sutured together and rounded to provide a, not only a resurfacing, but a bumper effect. And in each particular case, I feel very good about the technical aspects of the operation, but I really am unable to achieve all right, the long-term results. So I've revised more of those to, uh, uh, to shoulder uh, replacements, right, than I think uh, I should in order to, for it to be a, a successful operation. Okay. There's also another uh, type of surgery that sports surgeons uh, usually do it, like a CAM procedure. Dr. Millet, Peter Millet uh, published it uh, recently. Uh, it's a combined operation, I mean, uh, with a capsular release and uh, release of the nerve, axillary nerve with uh, osteophyte resections. Uh, do you feel it works in young osteoarthritic shoulder? Well, so, so first of all, I'll say I have no experience performing that operation. So, but I, I will give you my opinion. Uh, I think that any, any uh, innovative approaches to the treatment of these, this challenging population is worthwhile. I think it has to be looked at very carefully because two, for two reasons. Number one, we know from the experience with uh, arthroscopic treatment of uh, degenerative arthritis of the knee, and to a certain extent, the experience in the shoulder that every patient will get improvement for the most part for some period of time whether that improvement is gonna be on the order of six months, right? Or no. is it gonna be two years or three years? So if you think it's worth it, right? To perform an operation to achieve that relatively short-term benefit, then I think that's a reason to consider it. And there are many patients in this young population that the thought of a shoulder replacement is not very attractive to them. And they'd rather have a procedure that is less invasive, seeming, seemingly less uh, uh, with a, a shorter duration of recovery. So I think that's fine. And the procedure that you're describing from Dr. Millet or other similar procedures, it does not burn any bridges, right? It doesn't prevent, you know, you then you know, two years, three years or whatever, performing shoulder orthoplasty, assuming that there's no untoward event uh, that, that occurs. And I think there are patients with osteoarthritis, young patients who present with 
a significant inferior humeral head osteophyte and restriction of motion, but not a lot of pain. I think in those patients that if you can resect the osteophyte, do the capsular releases, even do a subacromial release, they will get improved range of motion. However, you have to be careful because once they have improved range of motion, the joint, because they're of their improved range, the joint may become more incongruous than before. And sometimes that can cause some pain. But I think that there is a role for the procedure that, that you described from Dr. Millett, right? But you know, the ultimate benefits remain to be determined. Okay. Uh, maybe our other guest uh, lecturer has a, maybe a question. Professor Benazzo, do you have any question to Professor Zuckerman? Uh, not really, because it's not my field. Yeah, of I know. <laughs> so, but, but I, I have a question. So I, I, love a lot. I love a lot. I love a lot. My field of interest. <laughs> so. No, no, but but I, I have a question for Dr. Benazzo. You, you you you heard what I said to you. Uh, the comment I made about the experience in knee replacement uh, and such, in terms of bone grafts Graf. versus implants. I mean, what has that been your experience as well? I'm sure there was a time in your career you were you were bone grafting tibial defects, right? As opposed to now, you're probably using wedges and other implants. Yeah, I will bring an example like that, like that. When I bone grafted the tibia in a case I would present, I was a very young skier. But nowadays I'm using augments, I'm using cones and so on. I'm still using bone impression grafting on the hip side because I like very much to cement on the bone impression grafting according to the technique of the Exeter and Slough. And it's very successful over there. So I have a, a contradicting behavior because I, I do use bone impression grafting on the hip and I do cement and I do not use bone impression grafting on the knee because I use cones and augments. Yeah. And uh, both, both sides I am successful so far. So, but the guys so, in my hospital, the, the shoulder guys in my hospital, uh, uh, they, they behave exactly as you do. They use your Exatec. Uh, uh, uh, prosthesis, and they also use Lima Corporate. Uh, they use also Permedic. I don't know if you know that, but Permedic is a Italian company producing a specific design of glenoid. And uh, I am helping them in collecting the data, and uh, they they are sharing very good results. In any case, using, I I think that uh, they have been a little bit disappointed in using the surfacing probably due to the uh, technical failures or not uh, uh, a deep enough learning curve, uh, but uh, very good results with the, with the reverse shoulder. What I have noticed in your talk that um, uh, you didn't present any case of, uh, of reverse shoulder prosthetic replacement. While in, uh, in my hospital, uh, it's uh, the most used design is reverse shoulder because most of the times uh, the rotator cuff uh, is not uh, working anymore. Uh, so I would like to know your opinion about that. Yeah, and, and that was, a, there was a, a few questions about reverses. So let me just make a few comments vis-a-vis yeah. what uh, uh, your comments. So, uh, just a word about the resurfacing since you mentioned it and I mentioned it before. I think the resurfacing shoulder replacement right, was popularized by Steve Copeland and continued by Arthur Levy. And I think those, are, those two individuals are outstanding surgeons and they can do that operation right, reproducibly and most people cannot. I think a recognition about the importance of getting the glenoid component you know, proper exposure and getting it in position makes it very difficult to do a, for me to do it on the resurfacing side. If you ask people uh, that do an operation from, uh, uh, uh, that do the operation for uh, uh, these young patients or do a shoulder replacement in general, what's the most difficult part of the operation? The vast majority of people will tell you it's glenoid exposure, right? Making sure you can I, visualize the glenoid, see the glenoid and understand the anatomy. So anything you do that makes that more difficult, right? I think is, has a negative impact. So that's why I'm not in favor of the resurfacing side. Now, there, are, there, are, there were some questions about reverses and I specifically left the reverses out of the talk, although maybe I should have included it. Uh, so in the United States, in uh, two years ago, reverses became the most commonly performed shoulder arthroplasty. It surpassed anatomic replacement. And there is no doubt that reverse shoulder repla replacement uh, has a very important role in the treatment of glenohumeral uh, arthritis and various disorders. 
in the young patient population, right, it has a role as well. However, since we were talking about glenohumeral arthritis, and as opposed to uh, uh, glenohumeral osteoarthritis, as opposed to post-traumatic arthritis or inflammatory arthritis, uh, I didn't emphasize the reverse. But I think there is a, a very important role for reverse shoulder arthroplasty in, in any patient now with glenohumeral arthritis. I think that we're learn we now have implants that uh, can stand the test of time. We don't know about 20, uh, 25 years or 30 years, right? But certainly at 10 to 10 to 12 to 15 year follow-up, that makes it an attractive option in young patients uh, that have the indications for it. And to me, the indications are the uh, uh, inflammatory arthritis, young patients with rheumatoid arthritis that have associated rotator cuff disease and post-traumatic arthritis in which there's so significant deformity, right? That there is no uh, other option that you could really reliably do. The role in patients with glenohumeral arth osteoarthritis, right? Is a more difficult one. So there was a question here about uh, how, what would I do in a, somebody who presents with a B2 glenoid uh, over 55, right? Uh, or let's say under 55, an augmented glenoid versus a reverse, right? Yes. Well, not all B2 glenoids are created equal. The degree of posterior subluxation has a lot to do with it. Somebody that has created an 80 or 90% posterior subluxation, to me, pushes me towards the reverse. However, in the younger patient population, I will do what I can right, to do an anatomic if they've got good soft tissues around. Now, I'm not sure uh, uh, I have a lot of good reasons for that because I think the results of reverses have been very good, right, absolutely. But I do think that it's worth more of an effort in young patients to try and balance the joint. But if I can't balance the joint or if I think there's, but there's more, more deformity, then I can correct and I won't do it. Now, but in, in, so let's take the, the a B2 glenoid with posterior subluxation. That's a patient in a, in, a, in a 45 year old in which I'll do an anatomic and I will do a posterior capsulography, you know, internal capsulography to reduce the redundancy posteriorly to help balance the joint. In a 65 or 70 year old, I wouldn't do that. I would just do a reverse in, the, in that situation. So I, I, I will utilize it in uh, young patients uh, as a technique, but not more so in older patients. Okay. Now there was a there was a question here also about uh, you know uh, short yes. stem versus stemless, right? And I think that yes, we, this was oh. from Mehmet Demirtas from Ankara. And B two glenoid question was from Professor Mehmet Demirhan. He's the past president of SESEC. Yeah. From so, so so so yeah. the uh, I think there's a role for short stem and stemless. I think that if you're going to use a short stem, uh, you're probably better off with a stemless. However, right. The stemless doesn't allow me as much versatility with respect to eccentricity uh, on the humeral side and matching the anatomy. So you have to be uh, cognizant of that. So you may preserve bone, but you don't want to compromise your ability to restore the uh, uh, proximal humeral uh, anatomy because that will have an impact on outcomes. Now, the, uh, the question, again, there's a lot of interest in, in reverse, all right? So... Uh, uh, and maybe I should have talked more about that, and I apologize, all right? Uh, but but uh, th there, is a, there is an important and evolving role for the reverse. There's no doubt about it. I, uh, but I think you really, it should not be the first choice in, these patient in this patient population when they have an intact rotator cuff. If somebody has a irreparable, deficient rotator cuff, which is not all that common in the, in the patients under the age of 50, but you will see some in that situation, then you have to decide that those patients present uh, much uh, differently, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, because there are young patients that present with uh, massive irreparable rotator cuff tears who have great range of motion, right? They are able to, they have less pain, but they have very good function, but they're weak and they're not happy with it. Or, that, or they have pain with, with maintained range of motion. That's a more complicated uh, population of patients. You know, uh, uh, how much time do we have? Right. I, do, we have want... uh, 20, 25 minutes. Okay, more. so I have a brief talk on, uh, on uh, reverses for massive cuff tears, right? Okay. Uh, 
You want me to do that for you? Yeah, of course. Okay, okay. Let me see if I can just pull it up here. All right, hold on a second. All right, let me see. Let's let's get let's close that. All right, and minimize that. I want to get rid of my. But we, you know, we have still. uh, concerns about the reverse shoulder arthroplasty for young patients because when we when we do uh, total shoulder total anatomic shoulder very well perfect it yeah. uh, it works great the rotations and elevations and everything pain but in reverse shoulder arthroplasty we sometimes lose the internal rotation they are not yeah. happy yes yes so th- th- th- that's that, my concern th- th- that is that is a problem all right now just let me I'm trying to get uh, access to my desktop here. All right, hold yeah, on. Okay. Give me a minute. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, let's see. So if I share my screen here. Okay. Uh, here. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, so this is this is a this is a talk that I gave at the uh, British Elbow and Shoulder Society me- recently about. Uh, so, uh, even though it's not completely on the topic of young patients, since so, so many people have asked about this, maybe uh, uh, it's worthwhile. Is that okay with you? Yes, please. Okay. So, so. Uh, uh, yeah, listen, there's no doubt that patients that have irreparable rotator cuff tears uh, are candidates for reverses, right? However, not all of these patients are, are treated alike, right? So p- patients that have uh, uh, massive rotator cuff tears before the reverses, there were very limited options available. You could do a, basically a hemiarthroplasty, right, and achieve some pain relief, but there was no particular improvement, uh, improvement in function in that patient population. I know that because we report our own experience uh, on, uh, back in 2000 in which you know the patients had limited goals and they did okay, but they weren't really particularly happy with the results. So the reverse has been a great benefit. So when you think about the arthroplasty for people with massive rotator cuff tears, there are three different scenarios. One is the patient with a massive irreparable cuff tear who does not have arthritis, right? There's the other two categories, a rotator cuff deficient shoulder with arthritis is a different category, and the cuff tear arthropathy is the third category. So here, you look at the x-ray on the left, basically no arthritis, superior migration, a massive cuff tear in the absence of arthritis, right? So this is the description of of that particular patient population. They may have had uh, previous surgery, right, but they have a massive multiple tendon tears. They have uh, atrophic changes of the rotator cuff, right? And they have minimal or no arthritis. However, right, there is a spectrum of these patients, right? All patients with irreparable rotator cuff tears are not created equal. You can uh, differentiate them in terms of range of motion, their pain level, the age in which they present, whether they had previous surgery, and also their expectations. So there are two types of patients in general. Uh, I'm going to call this patient A. This is the patient who presents with a pseudo-paralytic shoulder, severe disabling pain, older, right, and a more sedentary activity level. But then there's patient B, the patient who presents with near full range of motion, disabling pain, much younger in that young category, with a higher activity level and a much different set of expectations as to how they want to, uh, what they expect their shoulder to be able to do. So in general, uh, the principles apply. You have to look at the patient, interpret the clinical findings, look at the imaging studies and consider your different implant options. So for me, although these are the li- limited, the listed implant options, these patients, right, who are best suited with a reverse shoulder arthroplasty, regardless of age, if no other options are available, right? So I'm going to not discuss this one or that one, right? So uh, let's just go right to the reverses. The reverse has become the treatment of choice for these patients, right? So in this particular patient here, this is an older patient, 67, massive cuff tear, you know, no glenoid deformity, a reverse, right? However, when you compare patient A, the older patient, with patient B, the younger patient, right? 
what, what, what can we expect in terms of clinical outcomes? So there are a number of different articles that have been out there, right? This one by Boileau in 2009, that basically said, if you do this reverse in patients who only have pain, but have a very good motion greater than 90 degrees of elevation, right? A much, a 27% uh, dissatisfaction rate and a higher revision rate. Uh, Frankel reported the same thing, a 20% complication rate in his early series using his implant in younger patients in which pain, not functional limitation was the issue, right? And then this one in 2013 shows the same thing, but even more so in Gerber's long-term follow-up series, they had a very high complication and revision rate in younger patients for, who underwent reverses for irreparable rotator cuff tears. Now, and in this one, you know, uh, there were some factors associated with poor outcomes, but age less than 60 degrees and better preoperative function were the two most important. So now one thing I didn't include here is we, I just sent an article uh, for review into the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, looking at 200 patients from our database who underwent a uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty for a uh, massive cuff tear divided into patients who had range of motion, preoperative range of motion, forward elevation above 120 degrees versus those that had a preoperative range of motion below 60 degrees uh, of active forward elevation. And our results showed that you can get excellent outcomes in both groups in terms of function, pain relief, and a limited, a very a minimal revision rate, complication rate. So, so why, am I, why is our approach different why are our results different than what's been reported out there? I think that when you have cases that were done in 2008, nine, or reported then, we've learned so much more about reverse shoulder arthroplasty and the design of the implants, the assertion of the implants and the indications. It doesn't surprise me that, we, that the, re, the results have been improved because uh, that's been true overall. Look at the complication rate early on in the, uh, when we did reverses but the reverses uh, that are done now have a much lower complication rate because we've learned so much more. It kind of mirrors the early results of hip replacement in which you had you know, the 10, 15% dislocation rates before we really understood the operation as well as we did. So for these, this patient population, I'll focus on patient B and the patient with a uh, uh, massive rotator cuff tear that has a painful shoulder, near intact range of motion is younger, right? I want to have a clear understanding with the patient of what their expectations are. I will do a reverse, but I want to make sure they really understand what the, what the goal is. And when I do that operation in that young patient who, you, who uh, the, you asked a question about on the chat, I want to preserve all the intact rotator cuff tissue. I, want to, I will consider a subscapularis sparing approach because that's oftentimes the only portion of the cuff that's intact. I want to carefully assess range of motion intraoperatively, and I will repair the subscapularis uh, if it's possible, because I think that's important, right? And in this patient, the younger patient with a massive cuff tear, I avoid excessive tensioning uh, because that will affect postoperative range of motion. So, uh, and uh, okay, I'm going to stop there because I don't want to make too, make too much time. All right, let's just go back okay, thank you. to where we were. All right, how are we doing on time, okay? Now we are very happy to have okay. two topics from okay. you. <laughs> okay, so, so there's another question from Sarjan Akpınar from Adana. He was your former fellow from SESEC. Okay. He was with you 20 years ago, I guess. And he asked about what do you think about the longevity of the reverse shoulder prosthesis in young patients? Again, reverse shoulder. <laughs> Right, reverse. I know. See, everybody, everybody is interested in reverses. There's no, there's no, <laughs> doubt, no doubt about it, all right? Because it is, as Dr. Benazzo points out, it is the most common procedure that is uh, that uh, shoulder arthroplasty procedure that's being done. Uh, listen, I, I, don't, I don't have the, the answer, all right, to uh, what the long-term outcomes are going to be, right? But I do know that the, my enthusiasm for reverses is only increasing. So last, year, last week, this past week, I did four shoulder replacements on Tuesday. I was, it was scheduled as three, three reverses and one anatomic. I wound up doing four reverses because the anatomic had much more glenoid deformity than in a 70-year-old than I thought I could correct, all right? So I did a mid-course correction. This, this week, I have three shoulder replacements, all reverses, right? So I'd say my practice has now gone 70% 
it reverses 30% anatomic. So I think there is great enthusiasm for it, right? But I also think you have to in, in gradually, you have to uh, evaluate each patient individually. But I would not hesitate to use it in a young patient if that was the only option. Now, that being said, just yesterday in my office, I saw a 60 year old, right? A, uh, a sculptor, a woman who works with heavy power tools, excellent range of motion, massive rotator cuff tear, and uh, not a lot of pain, but functional loss, right? Mm. I would not do a reverse in her because I can't achieve the outcomes that she wants. So I, I had her seen by my associate who will consider, you know, is gonna do a superior capsular reconstruction to try and improve the, the strength and the function in that way. So you have to be, again, you have to individualize uh, every patient in this regard. Now, before I gave that other talk, a question came up about the restricted range of motion uh, in internal rotation, yeah. right behind the back. So th that has been an ongoing issue. Uh, that's something I talk to patients about all the time. In, in if somebody I'm considering for an anatomic versus a reverse, they ask me, what's the difference? And I tell them there is no difference in terms of pain relief and function in the frontal plane in terms of range of motion overhead and such. However, with an anatomic, you can expect to have reduced range, internal rotation behind the back. There are, some, there are clearly some exceptions, but that's something they have to understand. Now, who cares more about that? Women care more about it. They tend to do more things behind, behind their back than men do in hooking their undergarments and things like that. Now, if I have to do bilateral, bilateral replacements in somebody, to bilateral reverses, oftentimes on, if they haven't had good internal rotation on the first side, I will reduce the amount of retroversion in the humeral component when I do the other side to try and give them more internal rotation, right? So I will try and compensate in that regard. Yes, right. Professor Ibrahim Tunjai has a question. Uh, he's uh, asking about the stem. Uh, the trend will go for the stemless for you uh, because he said uh, humerus without stem is like a Scottish man without skirt, he said. Okay. So, uh, the trend, <laughs> I don't know if uh, it is the same in the hip surgery. The, it's going to be more uh, mini stem and after stemless prosthesis, but... In shoulder, what is your choice now? Yeah. What's so, your trend? So, so although I think there are certain analogies that I've made between hip replacement, knee replacement, shoulder replacement, I think the length of the stem is not, is not applicable from the hip to the, to the shoulder because of the weight-bearing nature of the joint and such and the stresses that it's subjected to. So uh, uh, right now, my, my implant of choice is a short stem implant. I will use a stemless when basically based upon age right, and bone quality, but whenever I can, I will use a short stem implant. However, uh, sometimes the bone doesn't support it, and I yeah. will use, you know, I use a standard length implant because I feel I've got better a better uh, diaphyseal uh, security, fixation, right, and that's what you need. So I don't think you can, all, you can do only one type or the other. I think you have to be ready to have all available because one thing's for sure, Although humeral component loosening has not been uh, emphasized as a problem, you know, how often do you re revise a humeral component, a non cemented humeral component, or a humeral or a cemented standard stem component for loosening? It's very, very uncommon, right? However, we don't want to make it more of a common problem. So let's make sure we're, we're putting an implant that can achieve the goals so we don't add that to the list of things that we have to worry about afterwards. Yeah. Okay, he has another question, Professor Ibrahim, ask about the cement use. Do you use cement and do you use antibiotic, cement with antibiotic? What's your okay. preference? So on, on, the, on the humeral side, right, it's uh, in general and particularly in, in young patients, right, I rarely, if ever, uh, utilize a uh, cement at all, right? Okay. Now, my goal is a non-cement, and it's been that way my whole career, right? I've re re the only time I will use cement is if the bone quality is so poor that I really think that I don't have a well-fixed uh, humerus. Now, let me also say one thing. Sometimes, you know, by the time I, I finish the procedure, I can see some 
uh, motion of the stem within the canal, right? I, I don't, that doesn't even bother me. I will accept that and let it and leave it that way because I think the humeral side is very forgiving in that regard. So I don't use cement on the humeral side. If I do need cement, like in a revision situation, uh, I generally only cement proximally, right? I put metaphyseal cement in for secure, for, for, to stabilize the implant, but not distally. I think getting the implant out uh, from a cemented implant, a long stem implant particularly, right, is very problematic on the humeral side. So I will avoid it. Now there have been some situations where just cementing proximally has been a, uh, uh, has not been secure enough and it's led to loosening, but that's very, very uncommon. In revisions, right, particularly in diabetics, right, I will use antibiotic cement in that particular area. Now, you can see from the glenoid that I use, it's a hybrid fixation model in which you only use a small amount of cement in the peripheral pegs. And that's standard simplex cement. I don't use antibiotic cement there uh, unless it's an unusual situation. Okay. There's another question from Vasim. Vasim was our fellow, former fellow from Pakistan. Peshawar. He asked about the opinion regarding young patient with ankylosing spondylitis with bilateral painful shoulder, RSA, anatomic or arthrodesis. Okay, so uh, the patients with ankylosing spondylitis are a very challenging population, right? Because oftentimes, uh, listen, the nature of the disease is the the significant spinal stiffness, but they oftentimes have uh, associated uh, arthritis of the hips, knees, and elsewhere. The shoulders, they, the shoulders are much stiffer than you would expect looking at the x-ray in my experience. So in those particular situations, before that I've had reverses available and I did anatomic, I was, I was generally disappointed with the functional outcomes. I thought I did a, a good operation in terms of restoring the anatomy, but I was unable to, they were unable to get the range of motion because it's just, it's a stiffening disease, right? Uh, now faced with a similar situation, I will generally use a reverse more commonly than an anatomic in this patient population. I think it's better. It hasn't resulted for me in much greater functional outcomes, but now I worry less about the other issues that can uh, develop uh, uh, in terms of stability and otherwise. Okay, and now the question of an arthrodesis. So uh, I've done one arthrodesis in the last 10 years, all right? And that was in a multiply operated shoulder for instability that got infected, all right? Uh, I don't see the role for arthrodesis other than in the chronic infections uh, with significant bone loss or uh, in the uh, paralytic shoulder, like brachial plexus uh, deficit. And in somebody with ankylosing spondylitis, which is a, a uh, uh, uh, multiple joint disease, right? You really can't consider an arthrodesis because they're probably going to have poor function on the other side as well. And that becomes more disabled. Okay. Another question uh, for the conservative treatment of them. Do you, is there a room for the orthobiologics for you, like PRP or stem cells in US? Yeah. So uh, if you go by the data, the, re the, the evidence, there is no role for, you know, stem cells or PRP, right? Now, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not used a lot, right? And I will have patients, young patients with glenium arthritis who ask about that, right? And, you know, I tell them, I don't think there's a lot of data to support it, but I send them to my, our sports medicine people who will do the procedures, yeah. right? And if it works out, it works yeah. out. Again, that's a procedure that does not burn any bridges, right? It doesn't prevent having something done late, late, later on. Now, the role of things like, uh, you know, visco supplementation injections, right, which the data for me, even for the knee, has never been overwhelmingly positive. Again, some of our sports medicine people use it in the shoulder. I don't think it has a particularly important role there, there either. But in the patients that, whose goal is to avoid surgery, right, to avoid an implant, to uh, uh, not go to the operating room, they're going to utilize these things. Now, keep in mind, in the United States, there's only a limited use of stem cells, right? We can harvest stem cells from the fat or the bone marrow, but we can't uh, grow it in culture, right? So if we can harvest a million cells, we have to inject a million cells. We can't harvest it and like they do in Germany and re-inject 100 million cells, which may be more effective. It, it, this, this is a very important area 
of research. I just would like to see some data. Okay. Another question from the audience. Now we have uh, 150 participants currently live. Uh, another question from Sarjan Akpunar from Adana again. Uh, do you experience any difficulties in regard of revising hybrid glenoid component? Okay, so revising a hybrid glenoid component, right, comes in two situations. The first situation is when the component is loose, right? You know, it's loose, it's no longer fixed. That's an easy situation. There, getting the implant out is not problematic. Uh, however, the amount of bone loss you have to address because of the loose implant, that becomes the challenge. Now, in, in patients that have a well-fixed hybrid component, who you're revising because of rotator cuff deficiency and you're revising it to reverse, right, the hybrid, com the, the non-semantic component can be well fixed. Therefore, it's important to have the tools necessary to remove it with a minimal amount of bone loss, which in our experience, at least the implants that I use, we've been able to do with some degree of consistency. So, uh, but again, these situations, uh, one thing's for sure, all revisions are not the same. And you really have to look at each one individually. I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned about the peripheral peg fixation and the cement, right? Because oftentimes uh, that comes out easily, but you're left with the cement and getting the cement out can be more of, of a bone losing operation. Yeah. Another technical question. We have uh, four minutes for the for conclusion. So uh, what's your subscapularis management? Uh, do you have special tricks okay. for it? So and what's your rehabilitation program after? Okay, so an anatomic replacement. Uh, I've uh, generally been, uh, I, I prefer a subscapularis tenotomy, right? That's, I divide the subscapularis and repair it uh, uh, at the end of the procedure. And I always combine it with a repair of the rotator interval, right? I will, why do I repair the rotator interval? For a number of reasons. Number one, I think that uh, decreases the tension on the lateral suture line because now I've got to secure it superiorly. So uh, it's, it's, it's a tether against you know, disruption. Uh, I spend a lot of time repairing the subscap and I want to make sure it's, it's secure to my satisfaction. I think other approaches to it, you know, use doing a lesser tuberosity osteotomy has a role, right? I've not used that with any regularity, just as a matter of preference. For about three years, I did, a, I did the... Uh, uh, subscapularis sparing arthroplasty through the rotator interval that was popularized by uh, Lafosse in, uh, yeah. in uh, France. Uh, and uh, although I thought I got very good at that during the, op during the operation, it was all, the glenoid for me was always a challenge. Uh, and now with my appreciation on the importance of really getting the glenoid in the right position, I decided that I, since I couldn't put the glenoid in as well as I wanted to, I stopped using, using that procedure. However, I will tell you that when you finish that procedure, you, the subscapularis is intact. Patients would wear a sling for you know, a few days, maybe a week or two, but you don't worry about them, them, their uh, activities and they progress very rapidly. So there was some benefit for that. However, to me, it just decreased the, uh, the option on the, on the uh, uh, side. Now, one other thing about subscapularis management, yeah. As I said, there are three approaches, tenotomy, uh, a subscapularis peel, and a osteotomy. If you think about what we know about healing of tissues, probably the most uh, reliable healing that we can achieve is probably bone to bone. I think the second most reliable is tendon to tendon. And the third most reliable is tendon to bone. Look at all the problems we've had in achieving successful rotator cuff re uh, repairs. So that's why I never quite understood the enthusiasm about doing a subscapularis peel in which you basically have to rely on tendon to bone healing afterwards. So that's why I've always focused more on the tenotomy or the osteotomy portion of it. Okay. Maybe last question from Mustafa Karan, Professor Karan from Istanbul, our former president of society, Shoulder Society. Uh, we thank you so much for the delightful lecture. Did you have any arthroplasty experience with bodybuilders? What's your recommendation towards weight training after arthroplasty? Oh yeah, that is a very difficult population. So first of all, the operation itself 
right, is very difficult because they have massive musculature and getting the exposure. And frankly, it's not as much on the glenoid side. I find the humerus even more challenging, right, yeah. in this patient population. And no matter how many times I tell them, you can't go back to doing what you did before, right? And no matter how often they agree, you know, they wind up doing what they did before. Now, fortunately, thus far, I have not had anybody that, uh, that has uh, uh, had a major problem from what they've done, but I don't have that, that many really uh, uh, uh, heavy duty uh, uh, weightlifters, right? I did have one person who went back too soon and completely disrupted the subscap repair, all right? Now that, that was a problem that couldn't be repaired. I had to revise that to a reverse. And I think he learned his lesson in that regard. Okay, thank you okay. very much. I have last question for you because I know you are a great teacher. Uh, you have more than 300 uh, fellows uh, graduating from your institution. Do you let your residents or fellows to do surgery, arthroplasty, so shoulder arthroplasty surgeries or when? Yeah. Which year? So so, so this, is, this is important because teaching is very important to us. Yeah. So I, have, I do my operations now, the shoulder arthroplasty, with a, a fifth-year orthopedic resident, a chief resident, and our shoulder fellow. And I've, the system, uh, when they, the residents are on the rotation for two months, right? The fellow is there all year. So at the beginning of the rotation, we, we focus on having them do the surgical approach and the exposure, right? But, and then... Uh, and I rapidly, right, allow basically, you know, I take the, the uh, resident through the humeral side, right? And then for the second month, you know, we take them through the glenoid side, right? But they're always there supervised, right? And they don't watch me do the operation, right? It's a, it's a learning experience in which we have graduated responsibility, which I think is important, right? Because yeah. uh, that's how you learn. All right, that's all there is yeah. to it. That's how we yeah. all learned, right? Okay. Yeah, we learn with, with our complications. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You have to, because ultimately, yeah. ultimately, when the pay, when the resident rotates after two months, or the fellow leaves after a year, right? It's our practice and our patients, so we have to take yeah. care of them. The most important. <laughs> You're right. Right. You're right. Okay, time is up, uh, Professor. So Listen, I'd I, like I, to I, conclude the session and move to the next one. I would like to thank you again for your great, excellent contribution. I hope to see you in person in the future uh, it, congress it, it, soon it would be my happy pleasure birthday to, join you. to your wife to your lovely wife <laughs> thank Please you very much you're very kind and best regards to her thank you and stay safe and healthy thank you Goodbye, same to you all right have a great holiday thank you Evet kıymetli meslektaşlarımız omuz artroplastisi oturumundan sonra genç osteoartritik hastada diz artroplastisi oturumuna devam ediyoruz. Ee, konuşmacımız İtalya'dan Francesco Benazzo. Ee, Türkiye'de oldukça tanınıyor kendisi. Ee, diz artroplastisinde ciddi bir e, hem cerrahi hem literatür tecrübesi var. Ee, şimdi sözü lafı çok fazla uzatmadan kendisine bırakıyoruz. Ee, hi again Dr. Benazzo. You are welcome to our meeting again. Uh, now we can continue with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you see my screen. Do you? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I really thank Ibrahim Tukai for the, allowing me to share with you my experience uh, with the knee arthroplasty and uh, specifically in a young osteoarthritic patient. I am working now in Brescia. This is my new hospital where I'm working. I'm still belonging to the University of Pavia. These are my disclosures. Uh, and uh, the, my work with Zimmer Biomet has to do with uh, some uh, uh, specific topic of my, topics of my talk. So uh, uh, when we deal with a young patient, uh, what is the definition of young patient? Youth is a period between childhood and adult age, but when young is young, it's a chronological or biological age. Uh, it depends on the level of activity and the demands of the patient. For some authors, uh, a young patient is uh, below 65, for others is below 55 years of age. But anyway, uh, if we are dealing with a case like that, this is a male 60 or 60 years old, is a former Argentinian rugby player with a hypertrophic osteoarthritis in the right knee. 
So there is no much discussion on that because uh, the solution could be a total knee replacement. And you see that uh, the results are uh, quite good because uh, after a few months from the surgery, he's able to walk normally and also to jump and run normally. And uh, this is a very good result. And uh, uh, just looking at the literature, uh, the good results in the young patient are directly correlated to the quality of physical performance done and able to be performed before surgery. So if we have younger, lower functioning patients, uh, we, have, uh, we, have to, we, we may expect lower results. And uh, this is extremely important. So active patient, uh, they are supposed to have better results with total knee arthroplasty. Uh, uh, but uh, the, you see that uh, we may have some, uh, uh, some issues because this is a paper of JPRVZ and it's a multi-center investigation of, of uh, over 600 young patient. The mean age was 54 years and the age 19 to 60 years and 71% were females. And you see that 66% uh, uh, of the patient only indicated their knees as normal. And 33 reported some degrees of pain, other stiffness, other uh, reported grinding or noises, swelling, tightness. And 38% uh, uh, reported difficulty getting in and out of the car or out of the chair. And uh, uh, only 50% uh, have been able to participate in the most preferred sport. So not so uh, not very good results for that. And uh, uh, the, uh, what about the new arthroplasty design? And uh, in this paper published in, uh, in CORE in 2015 by this group of uh, very well-known uh, US uh, surgeon, you see that uh, the use of newer implant design did, did not improve patient satisfactions. And uh, the presence of uh, symptoms after surgery was, were worse uh, if compared to an old design, 10 years old uh, CR design. And so <clears throat> the, the use of a very new designs doesn't influence the quality of the results. And also these, uh, of course, uh, these are very old design and the very old design on the other hand they are not behaving very well so the the the worst uh, uh, uh, results were obtained with the ib2 prosthesis and the thin polyethylene but the number of patients in this paper is not so high because uh, it's 88 patients with 115 total knee arthroplasty but uh, 70% uh, survivorship for all cause failure was noted at 30 years, so a very long term uh, uh, uh, follow up. Uh, what is the evidence for total neutroplastic in young patients? And this is a review. So uh, they tried these authors to answer three points, three questions. How uh, uh, total neutroplastic perform in young patients? whether it's a durable procedure for young patient, and what guidance the literature outlines for total arthroplasty in young patient. So they have seen, uh, considering a certain number of papers uh, uh, included in this uh, review, in this meta-analysis, uh, that uh, the overall functional score increased uh, by 47, the clinical, and 37 points, the functional score. Uh, implant survivorship was 96% and 99% during the first decade, and uh, it dropped to 85 and 96 during the second decade of follow-up. And uh, they have underlined that uh, the literature the, uh, does not uh, make any specific uh, uh, direction, uh, any specific suggestion for techniques uh, uh, for total arthroplasty for young patients. Uh, looking at this paper, taking account of the uh, future uh, uh, demand for uh, primary and revision uh, joint replacement, uh, if we look at the knee replacement, uh, you see that uh, uh, in the next 10 years, uh, a, a, an increased number of total knee arthroplasty is expected, as well as revision total knee arthroplasty. And uh, if we compare with the hip uh, uh, uh, primary 
uh, replacement, uh, you see that uh, the increase is not as high as a new replacement, and the number of revision perspective is much lower. So that means that uh, probably they consider that the hip replacement is an easier technique or the quality of the material is better and uh, the total anthroplasty procedures they will increase but also we will expect uh, they will expect an increased number of revision uh, this is a paper coming from the registry in finland and they took in account uh, over 32,000 totally arthroplasty uh, for primary or secondary osteoarthritis. And uh, the, uh, the crude overall implant survival improved with the crisis age, so between 40 and 80. And so the five year survival rate was 92 and 95 in patients uh, below 55 and between 56 and 65 years, respectively, compared to 97% of survival rate when the age of the patient was above 65 years. And look at here, this is the age range between uh, uh, uh, the uh, 50, below uh, 55 years, age range between 56 to 65, and age above 65 years. So the younger the patient, the worse the results uh, in the long term. So uh, just uh, summarizing a little bit this data in, uh, of total neutroplasty in young osteoarthritic patient, uh, the indication should be strong and where there is no other solutions. So we must have bone on bone and a severe impairment of the activity of daily living. Uh, questions still uh, are open on the type of implant, new or older proven designs. Question on the techniques, if we have to follow the fully manual technique uh, uh, uh, for experienced surgeons or using technology like PSI, computer assistive, sensor or robotics. And also the discussion on the alignment is still open, but we will be back on these uh, specific issues. So let's uh, go to another topic. What if the osteoarthritis is partial? So total neutroplasty is when we have three compartments involved, but when we have only one or two compartments uh, with osteoarthritis, what can we do? Do we have alternatives? So we have many different therapies. You can see injection, physio, wait and see, scoping, stem cells. We already mentioned the stem cell for the shoulder, PLP, maybe magicians or uh, only anti-inflammatory drugs. What about partial knee replacement? And uh, this is the other chapter, which is very interesting for the young patient. When we have medial osteoarthritis, a real consensus is not still available because uh, there are papers dealing with the fact that uh, comprehensive comparative data ac uh, across uh, the three treatment options, uni, total, or HEO, IT, osteotomy, uh, is not available. So still uh, there is a lot of disagreement of what to do in a young patient with a medial or a lateral osteoarthritis. For sure, uni behaves for the young osteoarthritic patient better than total because we preserve the bone stock, we preserve the soft tissues, we can provide the patient with a more natural gait pattern in kinematics, improve range of motion, reduce operative time, and reduce incisional size if this matters for the patient. Uh, uh, I published uh, uh, quite a, a, a good number of papers on that. These are my indication as I published in the last uh, Insel Scott Kelly edition of the surgery of the knee uh, in 2017. And uh, all these indications are very well known. I underline the fact that uh, we must have uh, a full range of motion, intact SEL and PCL. And look at their age above 60. But if we uh, widen the, the indication, the age can go below 60, uh, not to talk about the DMI. The CL deficient knee could be addressed with a uni in a low demanding patient. But again, we will be back on this uh, issue uh, in the uh, following slides. If we consider mobile bearing, these are the classic indication for uni for the Oxford knee. And again, we should have medial bone on bone, functional intact SEL, full thickness, uh, lateral cartilage, functionally normal MCL, acceptable patellofemoral joint, 
but if you read in the small lines, patient age, weight and activity level, these uh, factors, they do not preclude Oxford Uni mobile bearing. So again, the uh, dogma of the age is not uh, important anymore. And uh, uh, it's already been published also by a US surgeon. There is currently no limitation with respect to patient age, as long as the patient has bone on bone anteromedial disease and meets the inclusion criteria. So again, it's important to underline that we must address the patient with a bone on bone disease. And this is a typical example. It's a female, 53 years old. This is a weight bearing X-rays and this is immediately after surgery. And you see that uh, there was some insufficiency of the ligament, but with some tricks that will be mentioned again, we can address this knee as well. And uh, just before going to the uh, uh, issue of the ligament, uh, let's discuss a little bit of the universus osteotomy because uh, in the young patient, uh, a lot of surgeons, they prefer with a bone on bone contact on the medial side to uh, suggest and, and perform an osteotomy in a situation like that. And this is the, uh, the Rosenberg view showing the bone on bone contact on the medial side. I think that uh, we do not have uh, the same indication. We have, may have some overlapping between uni and osteotomy. But uh, you see, this is a typical situation. This is a narrowing of, of the medial uh, uh, compartment of the, of the joint. And uh, with the uni, we can realign completely uh, the knee because uh, we supply we substitute uh, the absence of the cartilage and the wear of the bone with the thickness of metal and plastic. And uh, uh, we can reach uh, such a good results. Again, I want to underline also the obliquity of the tibial cut because uh, we have to respect uh, the obliquity of the, uh, of the tibial anatomy to achieve the best uh, results. Uh, the osteotomy should be performed before the contact of bone on bone and when we have a tibial metaphysial virus, as uh, in this example. And what if we have narrowing of the medial side and the bowing of the proximal tibia? This is exactly the point. We can choose between uni, but uh, we will have again the, the, the bowing of the metaphysial portion of the tibia, overloading the plastic. Or we can choose an osteotomy, but uh, we will not address completely the medial compartment osteoarthritis. These are the cases where I do associate medial uni plus the uh, osteotomy of the tibia. We see some technical tips because I do not overcorrect the HTO, the osteotomy, and I can adapt the slope of the, uh, of the, of the tibial tray. Let's go to the SCL deficiency and medial osteoarthritis. This is a sentence which is very clever. Few rules are known in medicine, but one of these assumes that uh, uh, unini for medial osteoarthritis contraindicated if uh, the anterior crochet ligament is functionally deficient or absent. But we can consider that young patient, they may have the two things together in the SCL deficient knee and the osteoarthritis of the medial side. And theoretically, it's ideal for this young patient with high expectation to replace the medial compartment with a uni and to substitute uh, the SCL with an SCL reconstruction. There are technical problems because the tunnel positioning is important, the approach and the stability of the implant is important. The most important problem issue is a possible contact when we do have a tunnel widening with uh, the metal tray. And uh, this can cause also possible tibial base plate subsidence. So I found that uh, this technique is contraindicated in the small women. The solution for that is to place the tunnel on the tibia closer to the tibial tuberosity. And uh, so uh, transferring uh, this uh, tunnel away from the, from, the, from the tibial tray. And this is also uh, 
um, supported by some data in the literature. You see here, we should uh, displace the, uh, the tibial tunnel toward the tibial tuberosity. And this is a, an example, you see, that uh, we have been far away from the tibial tray in order to uh, avoid any possible contact and impingement of the uh, new ACL. And in that uh, specific paper, you see young age, high functional request, uni plus reconstruction, low functional request, uni without reconstruction. And there is a trick. It is sufficient to decrease the slope of the tibial tray. So to place it zero, to cut it zero, the sagittal way, the, the tibia, in order to <coughs> uh, um, give some stability to the knee. Of course, in the elderly, uh, total knee arthroplasty is suggested. What we do that uh, in the elderly, when we have an indication of the uni and the SEL is sufficient, we place a uni with a neutral slope and also for the young guys with low, which are low demanding. And these are our indication, in addition to the algorithm presented in the, by uh, these authors in the Journal of Orthopedic and Traumatology four years ago. But let's jump to another topic very important. We know that the tibial plateau uh, has a different behavior and different anatomy, medial from lateral. It's a concave on the medial side, it's a convex on the lateral side. Is uh, meniscus is more rigid, uh, more stable on the medial side, and it can move freely on the lateral side. And this is an uh, MRI of the medial side. And here, MRI motion on the lateral side. And you see that uh, the lateral condyle can shift backward. So this is a physiological kinematic. Can we reproduce it? Is it wise to aim this target in young osteoarthritic patient? Uh, uni is an option, but also combine small implants. So we can combine two unis or a unipatellofemoral joint because we can preserve the intact elements of the knee, uh, not deranged or ruined by the osteoarthritis, the cruciate or the other compartments. So we can think of a biuni or a bicondylar, medial uni plus patellofemoral joint or lateral uni plus patellofemoral joint. And uh, the advantages of this partial replacement are that we can preserve both cruciates. We can uh, adapt to the slopes of the uh, pristine anatomy of the knee. We can uh, position, therefore, the components in a different way, medial and laterally. So we adapt to the abnormal anatomy and we can respect the physiological kinematics. Is this true? Well, this is an example. No patellofemoral pain by unit two years. And the indication or, uh, uh, has been already well described in the same book I mentioned uh, before. So we can uh, adopt this solution when uh, Overall speaking, generally speaking, when total knee arthroplasty is an overkilling solution, because with a total knee, we sacrifice good, healthy portion of the knee. And uh, these are the indications for the uni plus uh, patellofemoral osteoarthritis. Uh, does it work? Well, uh, I've been uh, working on uh, with the Cucaro bone caliber knees, just to make the story very short here. The, we have reproduced on the cadaveric knee uh, the uh, stairs down, by the way. This is an intact uh, knee. This is a knee with only one uni. This is the same knee with the two unis. And this is the same knee, two unis, and resected ACL. And you see that except the case when the ACL has been resected, on the medial and lateral side, the two unis knees, they work very well, very similarly to the intact knee, as well as uh, the uh, only uni knee. And this is the level walking. Same thing when the ACL is resected, uh, these knees, they behave in an erratic way, but they do behave as like a normal knee 
in the, when they have one uni or two unis. So this is the demonstration that uh, this surgery can be really well adopted for young patient. Three compartments, well, I've done a couple of times, but uh, just paraphrasing the Jackass movie, don't do this at home. This is our experience. This paper has been accepted a couple of weeks ago uh, by the Bone and Joy Journal. And uh, you see here the, the clinical results of the uni plus patellofemoral joint. Uh, this is the score. And this is a survivorship with a long <clears throat> follow-up of this patient. This uh, mid to long term follow-up of combined small implants. And uh, it will be published soon. So let's go back to the total neanthroplasty world. Uh, again, this is a slide I already presented, but uh, I want to develop a little bit more the, uh, the three points I have left behind, implants, techniques, and alignments. Bearing options are important, and uh, this is the system I use. And the system has uh, the entire spectrum of different bearing options, crucial retaining, ultra congruent, media congruent, posterior stabilized, and costereo stabilized. And this option comes uh, in different systems available on the market. What is important to underline that in young patients, we should have improved quality of the polyethylene, cross lean vitamin E doped. I use mainly in a virus knee for the typical young patient, the medial congruent knee. Uh, uh, this liner has been conceived to mimic the physiological knee kinematics that uh, you have seen in the, with the experiments in the cadavers with the Kukarobo. Uh, it could be used uh, retaining the PCL or sacrificing the PCL. And uh, uh, it is... Uh, been shown that it can really provide the medial pivoting, not as in a boring socket mechanism, but as it, it is really in the, uh, in the real life. You see MC, three millimeters of motion on the medial side, 11 millimeters on the lateral side for the physiological motion of the knee. And these are the contact at 0, 45, 90 degrees of flexion. And uh, you see here the behavior of the uh, during flexion uh, with a, uh, uh, a CR knee and the MC liner with PCL. So it's a very good uh, stability in flexion and without the PCL. So same thing. So this liner provides, and the, this is very good for the young patient, a very nice uh, kinematic and stability. Let's go to the new alignment. Uh, uh, the new alignment, well, there is a lot of discussion nowadays. This is a typical young patient with the, this constitutional alignment of varus knee. And uh, to respect uh, this varus knee, uh, either we use a uni, or uh, nowadays it is becoming very popular, the kinematic alignment. But we also have uh, the, uh, this uh, different uh, or traditional uh, uh, alignment technique, the mechanical, the anatomical. And in between uh, the hybrid, restricted kinematic alignment and the adjusted mechanical alignment. So it's uh, just to make the, uh, uh, some comment on that. The kinematic alignment is a technique where no releases are needed. The mechanical alignment where most of the releases uh, are needed because we cut the bone according to specific bony landmarks, and then we adjust the ligaments uh, uh, after that. The anatomical alignment uh, uh, is uh, believed to respect the uh, varus cut of the tibia with less releases. Then we have also the uh, in-between uh, alignment, because uh, the kinematic alignment, when the knee is a very severely uh, disrupted in terms of osteoarthritis, uh, uh, the kinematic alignment is very difficult to be applied. And uh, that's the reason why uh, some uh, less uh, advanced kinematic alignment could be or should be adopted for this very severe constitutional knee valus deformity or severe valus deformity or severe valgus knee or when we have a patella marked lacking or instability. So the restricted kinematic alignment and the adjusted mechanical alignment should be adopted in this very severely 
uh, osteoarthritic knees. The lesson learned from the discussion of the, of the different alignment is that uh, kinematic alignment is not for everybody, despite the fact that uh, the autos, they report very good results. Restricted kinematic alignment shows the kinematic alignment limitation. So severity of deformity and patellofemoral maltracking. Mechanical alignment is uh, more reproducible, but because of the releases needed, the adjusted mechanical alignment where some virus has been respected can reduce the risk of outliers. Nowadays, in, for this, uh, we have uh, uh, different options and technology is uh, coming to help us. Uh, so from the active robotics to the aptic robotics, so the old the Robodoc, which has been revisited nowadays, and one version is already available or still available on the, on the market, to the very popular Meco or Navio aptic robot, and nowadays to the cobotic of uh, Zimmer Rosa robot. Just to go to the end of my presentation, we should take into account that uh, we have in young patient different uh, conditions or causes of osteoarthritis. The post-traumatic and the osteotomy cases, and these are quite frequent causes of total need for total neutroplasty or the replacement in young patient. This is an example of a valgus knee after the uh, uh, tibial lateral fracture. And you see that uh, the solution could be a minimal, a uni, a lateral uni uh, with a good realignment of the knee. And this is a male 55 years old with a very severe uh, deformed uh, uh, knee for uh, a tibial fracture. And you see here the solution where I have uh, joined a short stubby stem on the femoral side, a long uh, offset stem uh, on the tibial side, and increased level of constraint, a CCK, with a good realignment and a good <coughs> overall uh, alignment of the knee under weight bearing. And this is a male, uh, a skier, and you see that uh, the fracture of the tibia was so severe that uh, the repair, the ORIF open reduction and internal fixation was not perfectly done. And you see the CT scan here. This is a very old case. Uh, I mentioned this case during the discussion with Dr. Zuckerman because it was uh, before uh, the use of cones. And you see that I have filled the tibia with bone impassion grafting. And again, I uh, supplied uh, with a couple of screws over there for the fixation of the bone impression grafting. And uh, the wires you, have, you see here is because uh, it was necessary to perform a tibial tuberosity osteotomy for the approach of the knee. This is another case of a female where uh, the two-stage uh, procedure was necessary, removal of the plate. This is before surgery, after the removal of the hardware. And uh, this is a final result. And you see that in this case, I have associated short, stubby, fully cemented stem both on the femoral and tibial side and the cone uh, to increase uh, the uh, quality of fixation in the zone two of the tibia. And this is a follow-up two years. This is another young patient with 18 previous surgeries in the knee for a road accident. You see that uh, the knee is, uh, or the entire leg is severely deformed with an intra-articular and extra-articular deformity. The patellofemoral joint is completely out of order because the patella is running outside of the lateral condyle. This is before surgery and this is after surgery. So again, uh, if uh, the alignment is achieved, uh, the results from the clinical standpoint could be quite nice and satisfactory for the patient. This is a case of uh, HTO, uh, where in this female, 48 years of age, I have done a combination of HTO plus osteochondral graft on the medial condyle. After four years, uh, she came back with medial pain and the solution was a left medial uni 
when she came back uh, with the same pain on the other knee after a few months, I didn't uh, went through the osteotomy, but uh, my solution was uh, directly a, a uni knee uh, replacement. Very last point, uh, some remarks on uh, hemophilia, because uh, nowadays, okay, uh, before the advent of the uh, new medication, uh, the old guys, 72% of these uh, uh, patients have got more than three joints involved. Nowadays, we can uh, treat quite well this patient, but they come quite early with this condition, despite the good treatment. And so they do need a total joint replacement. I prefer in this case, in this patient, total joint replacement. This is uh, some example. I, uh, this is in a patient where I have performed knee and hip, not the uh, ankle, not the shoulder, and not the, the elbow. Just to go to the conclusion, uh, I hope that uh, I helped you in this journey through this uh, concept on uh, knee replacement, partial and total for a young osteopathic patient. Uh, uh, but uh, the doubts are always there. And our success, uh, sometimes we should uh, keep our doubts hidden at all times. But uh, as uh, these very clever guys told us many years ago, scientists as well as doctors will never understand because uh, we should believe in certain opinions just because we read in the book. So we must keep our doubting level very high because uh, we want to improve ourselves and we have to challenge uh, our knowledge and our skill almost every day. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Benazzo, for your great presentation. Uh, now we have some questions. The uh, first question is, uh, what is your opinion about cement total knee arthroplasty in young patients? Which indications would be appropriate? Cement less, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, it's, uh, it's a good option. Uh, there are two things that uh, uh, one is uh, uh, a economical point because they are quite expensive. So uh, uh, we cannot afford cementless prosthetic replacement. And I use uh, this solution only when uh, there are some uh, specific problems, such as hardware that cannot be removed, a nail uh, implanted many, many years ago before. And so I use uh, this uh, cementless uh, uh, designs. Uh, it's a good solution. But uh, at the end, if you look at the literature, uh, the, the results are not different uh, from the clinical and radiographic point of views from the cemented version of the same design or different design. So my option is nowadays to use cemented uh, designs. Yeah. Dr. Aliyev uh, has two questions. Uh, first, medial pivot design prosthesis uh, for young patients to increase satisfaction and achieve forgotten joint. And his second question is uh, robotic surgery, but you told about it. Yes. So I'm using the two things together. Uh, the most of the patient that we treat, uh, they have a constitutional virus or virus knee. The percentage of bulbous knee is less than 10%. And uh, even less if we consider the severe bulbous deformity. So in this uh, uh, uh, uh, patient uh, where I was using a PS design before, I'm using now a uh, medial congruent. It's not a really a bowling socket mechanism it allows us some motion uh, back and forth on the medial side. And uh, I think uh, that the results, uh, I am conducting the investigation in multi-center <clears throat> multi investigation here in Italy, are uh, uh, really uh, uh, sound. I mean, uh, the patients are quite satisfied. I'm using robotic surgery uh, every day. 
and uh, I'm using two different robots. My personal preference is to use uh, a Rosa, uh, which is uh, uh, a uh, moving slot, allowing me to use uh, power tools, the saw. Uh, I'm not uh, so familiar, I'm using, but I don't like too much uh, the uh, semi-aptic uh, uh, bore of the, of the Navio. Uh, in, both, in both cases, I think that uh, uh, robotic surgery is improving our accuracy in two things, in bone cuts and accuracy in uh, the interpretation of the knee in terms of the evaluation of the amount of bone to be removed, uh, of the ligament uh, compliance to allow uh, us to calculate exactly how much bone and where in which direction we should remove. So overall accuracy. The, uh, I have reached I have done uh, so far, despite the stops we had two times this year with the COVID, a 98 a prosthetic replacement with, uh, with Rosa, and I am following very strictly the patient. Uh, I wouldn't say that uh, the clinical results are extremely superior to the traditional technique, uh, but uh, the accuracy uh, is uh, absolutely outstanding. And uh, what is uh, really uh, outstanding is a possibility of adopting a specific alignment technique. If I want that knee in the varus, that knee with a mechanical, uh, adjusted mechanical alignment, I want, if I want to have that knee with a kinematic alignment, I can really do it with a, with a robot. And I have a step-by-step -step control of my surgery. What is the percentage of uh, using robot in your daily practice? Excuse me? Uh, what is your percentage of using robot in I, your daily practice? I'm using it almost every day, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it has been so successful in my hospital that we are purchasing a second robot next month in order to be able to uh, perform all the surgeries with this technique because uh, the clinical results uh, we have collected from the patient are really good. And so uh, the... It is difficult from the ethical standpoint to make a choice uh, from a patient who deserves robot and who uh, another one who does not who cannot uh, be treated because we only have two sets with one robot per day. So having two robots, we can have four knee prosthetic replacement per day, always robotics. Thank you. Dr. Bulant Attila from Ankara uh, has a question. Uh, he asked uh, your experience with joint preservation operations tend to risk the outcome of a future total knee arthroplasty. Uh, what do you mean the, uh, the uh, partial knee replacement? Uh, Can I read the, the question? Your, according to your experience with joint preservation operations tend to risk the outcome of a future total knee arthroplasty. Uh, joint uh, preserving operation, what does it mean? HTO, for example. Ah, HTO, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, joint preserving HTO. Yeah, uh, I, I, I try to explain what is my opinion on that. I mean, uh, uh, I have quite a low threshold in uh, uh, suggesting the patient to have a UNIV replacement when I have uh, a bone on bone contact of the medial side without deformity of the proximal tibia. Uh, when I have a deformity of the proximal tibia with some narrowing and overload on the medial side, I suggest the uh, HTO. So I do not overlap so too much uh, the two indications because I think that uh, one knee deserves uh, the uni, uh, we should perform the uni, not a, a, a HTO. Uh, the HTO, um, I reviewed all my cases of uh, HTO uh, uh, where I have uh, implanted a totemia to plastic years later, and uh, uh, there is no much difference in that, despite only the fact that uh, we can uh, postpone the removal of uh, differentiate, remove the hardware, after one year of the surgery. And so we, are, we have a almost a virgin knee when we perform the uh, total knee arthroplasty or we, when we perform a uni knee also after the uh, years after the HTO. 
uh, what I have presented, that's my idea when we had the association of uh, medial narrowing on medial overload, bone on bone contact, plus the virus on the metaphysical uh, uh, area of the proximal tibia, I like to talk with the patient and discuss the possibility of associating the two things together, a HDO and a uni on the same knee, which is a quite uh, demanding and challenging surgery because we have to downplace a little bit uh, the, the, the, the, uh, the, the plate because otherwise we don't have space for the, for the bone cuts on the tibial side. And uh, so it's quite challenging, but uh, the, I can achieve a very nice alignment, overall alignment of the knee. The risk is to have some stiffness later on. So the rehabilitation should be a very aggressive in this patient. But no, if I, I am not afraid of uh, implanting a total arthroplasty on a well-performed, long-lasting uh, uh, tibial osteotomy when the effect of the tibial osteotomy has ended after many years from the surgery. Thank you. Dr. Abdullah Gush has a question. All inside ACL reconstruction can help to solve problem of tibial tunnel and uni at the same setting. What is your opinion? Yes, it could, uh, of course. Uh, I'm not so good in uh, uh, performing this specific technique of all inside. Uh, in any case, uh, in a small tibia, uh, there is no space enough for the tibial tray and the ACL. So uh, I make my choice, um, in, but uh, the, the needs of reconstructing ACL plus a medial uni uh, is mainly for the men and not for the women. And at least in my, in my practical experience, in my clinical experience, uh, the, the small trick of uh, uh, uh, displacing the entry point on the tibia a little bit more uh, medial toward the tibial tuberosity is more than enough. And also because, you know, this uh, patient, they do not need an extra strong ACR reconstruction. We, it's sufficient to uh, provide this joint with a sufficient stability. And that's the reason why I don't use uh, uh, the uh, rigid fix and so on, but only a simple endobatum. The other uh, uh, trick to use is uh, to uh, uh, perform the uh, uh, SCR reconstruction arthroscopically, then to fix the proximally in the tibia, in the femur, the, the SCL, then going to the uh, uh, uni uh, bone cuts and replacement. And the very last step is to fix uh, the SCL on the tibial side. Because uh, if, we, if you perform the entire reconstruction of the ACL and then you go uh, to, the AC, to the uni replacement uh, uh, with a full reconstruction of the ACL, you may tighten the medial side. So I fix on the, later, on the proximal femur, then I replace the medial uh, compartment of the knee with the uni, and then I fix the very last step, the ACL on the tibial side. Thank you. I have also a question about this topic. Uh, if uh, ACL has gone, uh, this osteoarthritis is more than unicompartmental osteoarthritis in a degenerative joint. Well, <clears throat> this is not the indication. Uh, uh, so if, we, if the ACL is insufficient and we have only one compartment involved, the medial compartment, uh, uh, as I have described before, we can replace the medial compartment with a uni decreasing the slope or putting the slope at zero degrees. So exactly the same thing we, we do with the osteotomy of the proximal tibia when uh, there is an insufficiency of the SCL and we don't want to associate HDO and SCL. If the osteoarthritis involves more than one compartment and the, the SCL is disrupted or insufficient, I prefer to give an indication to a total joint and not to a partial replacement. Okay, thank you. Dr. Nurza Temel has a question. Uh, a 50 year old male patient has instability and medial arthrosis. Tibial slope is high, ACL reconstruction along with uni or osteotomy. Which one do you prefer? Uh, 
that depends on the degree of the medial osteoarthritis. Uh, the, uh, and uh, 50 years of age with a, uh, a severe uh, medial uh, compartment osteoarthritis where we have bone on bone contact uh, on the Rosenberg or Schuss view on the X-rays, I prefer a uni plus RCL. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Dr. Tunay Erden. Uh, young patient with grade three to, to four B compartmental osteoarthritis and posterolateral corner instability. What is your opinion? First treat the instability or together with or without arthroplasty? If they, there is no much uh, degeneration of the knee, so it's a set and the patient is very young, it's better to go with the posterolateral reconstruction <clears throat> uh, of the whatever technique uh, you want to use uh, for the posterolateral reconstruction with uh, <clears throat> augments, uh, whatever, and uh, then see the what happens after rehabilitation because uh, usually it's uh, very sufficient to decrease uh, the uh, level of complaints of uh, instability of the patient, to decreasing his uh, laxity and uh, decreasing the symptoms. Uh, the arthroplasty comes later, if necessity, if there is a necessity of doing that. Thank you. Uh, we have so many questions. Another question from Dr. Mehmet Arazi. In young patients with a very stiff knee, especially post-traumatic cases, which approach do you prefer? A quad snip or a tibial tubercle osteotomy? I always, <clears throat> that depends. That's, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the, uh, that depends where is the, the, the issue because uh, it is, uh, we have a post traumatic case where the patella is very low riding. Uh, uh, the approach uh, should be done with a tibial tuberosity osteotomy because the patella is low. With the tibial tuberosity osteotomy, we can also elevate uh, the patella up to one centimeter, usually no more, but it's enough to achieve a better range of motion. The quadriceps nip is only when the patella is very stiff, it's in proper position, but we have, for any reason, stiffness and adhesion on the proximal part of the, of the femur. So uh, they are uh, not overlapping when one with each other. There is indication for the tibial tuberosity osteotomy, there is indication for the quad snip. My, my preference usually for the knees I, I treat is to perform the tibial tuberosity osteotomy. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I would like to ask you about ceramic implants in total neartroplasty uh, in young patients, similar to total hip arthroplasty. Do you think that it is advantageous uh, in this younger group? Ceramic knee? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I have developed with Lima Corporate a, a version of the uh, traditional implant of Lima Corporate, uh, uh, multigen, uh, the ceramic version. There are two things. Uh, I have no experience with the Japanese ceramic knee. I have no experience with the Peter Brehm uh, uh, ceramic knee in Germany, which has a ceramic both on the femoral and tibial side. But uh, there are not enough designs available the ceramic doesn't allow to have the same modern designs that we have in many different uh, uh, uh, designs uh, available nowadays in terms of uh, thickness of the posterior condyles. And so uh, I have no, uh, we, we just uh, uh, stopped using that also because of the cost is they are extremely uh, expensive. And the design, uh, they are not modern design, so they are not conceived to allow full uh, uh, flexion of the knee or a good flexion of the knee. It, they can be used together with a uh, full polyethylene tibial component for very allergic patient. But you must discuss with the patient because, uh, because of the, the cost of the implant uh, and the uh, results in terms of uh, range of motion are not as good as uh, the available designs nowadays on the market. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim as well asked, do you replace the patella? 100% of the times, 100% of the time. Just uh, 
uh, wrote a paper that will be published on the EFORT journal during, uh, I think, this week, uh, this month, on the necessity, to my mind, that 99% uh, of the patient, they deserve the patella resurfacing. <laughs> <laughs> and I explained all the reasons why I think that. Thank you. Uh, another question is, which supports do you allow for your patients? Uh, for which type of prosthesis? When we think that they are younger patients, uh, which type of sports, sport activities do you allow? Uh, that uh, uh, brings me back to my very first slides. The sport that I have been able to do before, uh, I have no, uh, uh, nothing to say to the patient if they want to practice again that sport. Of course, I suggest to go bicycling uh, to avoid uh, uh, uh, long distance running, but it's up to the patient. If he feels well and the forgotten joint score is high, he can do whatever he wants. He must know that uh, the more he uses the knee, the more wear he, he put on the, on the polyethylene liner. So uh, uh, I always tell the patient, if he used this knee as uh, you have been using before when you were a football player, uh, you're going to be, uh, you're going to face a revision of this knee in uh, some years from now. So bicycling is okay, skiing is okay, and uh, uh, tennis is okay, on, uh, especially but in, in couple and not single. And um, there are many other sports they can do, but I do not put any restriction if the patient is satisfied and he feels the, the knee as own knee. That's the point. The proprioception of the, of the patient is absolutely important. And uh, until the patient doesn't feel the knee as his own knee, I limit the, the level of activity. But after that, they can do whatever they want. Uh, questions are coming. There is another question. Dr. Murat Sarkash asking uh, that we know that complication rates are higher in patients who underwent total knee arthroplasty after HTO. Should we give a chance before total knee by doing HTO in young patients with advanced stage arthrosis or should we do total knee? Again, HTO is a very specific indication. Uh, the uh, rate of complication, I mean, it's not a, what I've seen in my experience and uh, there is also in the literature, the complication are the stiffness uh, that the knee can, can have. So a decreased range of motion with a total knee arthroplasty after uh, a, a, a tibial osteotomy. But uh, again, there are indications for HTO, there are indications for TK. I do not overlap, I don't mix this indication. When there is the indication for a total knee, I do a total knee arthroplasty. And uh, when there is an indication for uni, I do a uni. When there is an indication for HTO, I do an HTO. Thank you so much. We have three minutes. Uh, and another you question. Didn't, you didn't comment a question. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> That there is a, a paper, a book on Rumi. Yes. <laughs> That's our historical, wonderful motorbikes in Italy. That I will not wear one of those. Unfortunately, <laughs> the, it's impossible to find this kind of motorbikes, but they cost a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and Rumi means in Italian, rooms, Rotami Uniti Messi Insieme. That spare part put together, spare part put together, but wonderful <laughs> motorbikes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Pati, may I ask last question? Uh, yeah, last question. For isolated patellofemoral joint arthrosis, uh, uh, do you have any experience with interposition arthroplasty with tensor fascia lata autograft? Yeah, excuse me, the uh, for isolated pathology, no, uh, I do not have any any any experience with that. For the isolated patellofemoral joint arthritis, when there is an indication for a uh, patellofemoral replacement, I do it. And there is the last question. <laughs> uh, Dr. Don Atlan asks, what is uh, your opinion about primary total knee prosthesis in young patients with severe plateau fractures, which distracted almost all joint? 
Uh, it's not clear if he's mentioning is uh, referring to acute fracture or yes. chronic fracture. Acute, acute fracture. fracture. In acute fracture, primary total knee instead of fixing to fracture. Yeah, yeah. I, I published a couple of papers on, on that. Uh, the uh, so if uh, it, the fracture uh, uh, in, uh, involves uh, the distal femur, I have um, and the distal femur is completely destroyed. I'm using a tumor resection prosthesis. The same thing on the tibial side, but on the tibial side, I try to reconstruct using cones or sleeves. And uh, if the uh, tibial tuberosity is still valid and available, and uh, I can use uh, screws on the through the tibial tuberosity to the, toward the cones of uh, tantrum of uh, of uh, of the TM cones. So I have a very low threshold of addressing these kind of problems with a total joint replacement, uh, but it's a different way from tibia and, uh, and femur. Thank you so much. Uh, there are many more questions, but uh, time is uh, up. Hocam, sizin do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Always, uh, your presentation is perfect. Uh, we would love to see you uh, in Istanbul anytime after this COVID era. Uh, it's not a good solution for this online system. It's not easy to go to the bathrooms by this online. Maybe we can solve a solution. I don't know what, how can we do it, but uh, we will do it next year, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the invitation, Ibrahim. Uh, I did my best uh, to share with you my experience on this uh, journey in the knee prosthetic replacement in young patient. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please uh, don't leave anywhere. And uh, after uh, Java's talk, uh, it's better to be here for the for discussion if you don't have any money. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Bye, Ivan. Good Thank seeing you, you Franco. Have a great day. And I love the book Rumi. Uh, that's <laughs> you. Fantastic. But Jay, I also have Moto Guzzi. Oh, fantastic. Oh, beautiful. Can you open your video, Joe? Yes, I, I have. have. I was just trying okay. to avoid you guys seeing my face because uh, it's uh, not so great. I'm sorry, you all have ties. I apologize. I'm still at no, work. No I don't, problem. I don't forgive say. me. But you, you're Italian, Franco. Anything you wear makes you look good. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, the difference. What about the snow in Philadelphia now? Yeah, we have a lot of snow, Brian. We have about six inches. I yeah, oh, it's very yeah. cold. Very, very cold. In the stone streets. And Istanbul is cold also or no? Uh, it's better than Philadelphia. It's cold, but not snow. Unfortunately, not snow. Okay. It's yeah. the problem of the world. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, and uh, Professor Parvizi is, uh, we are close friends. And uh, thankfully, uh, he is always with us. Uh, this is the Parvizis meeting, annual meetings, and uh, the, unfortunately he, he couldn't be able to be here because of this COVID, COVID times, and uh, uh, he has saved this uh, uh, very limited times for us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, please, Jawad, uh, sign is yours. Please start it. Uh, you are muted. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm I'm back on. Sorry. There was. Um, okay. Yeah. Perfect. So, Ibrahim, I'm sorry I didn't hear you. Did you want me to start my presentation? Yes, please. Okay. So, what I would like to do is to maybe give like three very quick presentation. I'll start with joint preservation, and um, I'll share my screen. And here we are. And then go full.
Perfect. So as you know, hip uh, pain in young adults has multiple causes, avascular necrosis, inflammatory arthritis, transient osteoporosis and other unusual conditions. And of course, young patients can get osteoarthritis of their hip and labral tear in recent years has been gaining a lot of attention uh, as a result of femoral stabber impingement. Uh, what does labrum do? Labrum is a fibrocartilaginous structure that deepens the acetabulum, provides shock absorption. It's very important in jo joint lubrication and stabilization of the joint. It seals the joint uh, to allow for synovial fluid to remain inside and to distribute the pressure across the um, articular cartilage. Labrum has been around for a long time. Labral pathology uh, is also well recognized. Limbus that obstructs uh, reduction during a pediatric dysplastic hip is one of those conditions. And labral tear le leading to uh, pain in adults was described by Dorel and Caterell uh, a long time ago. Labrum can tear as a result of trauma. Most of the time it tears as a result of femoral stabber impingement. Dysplasia leads to labral tear. Degenerative changes in the hip can also result in labral tear. And then there are hypermobility conditions, metabolic syndromes, and genetic predisposition. So when I see a labral tear, the first thing I want to know is, is it associated with dysplasia? Because labral tear in the context of dysplasia has a different solution and uh, uh, surgical uh, offering than a labral tear associated with impingement. And impingement can be either the cam type or the pincer type, as you see on this slide. Femoral stabber impingement was described by Professor Gans as a chronic anterior impingement that causes damage to acetabular rim and the adjacent acetabular cartilage. Uh, cam type is when the abnormality is on the femoral side with a bump on the femoral head that results in catching the labrum during flexion and internal rotation. Pincer, the abnormality is on the acetabular side with the socket being deep and results in counter coup injuries. But labral tear and femoral stabber impingement was really described a long time ago. It's a paper from 1936 by Smith Peterson. And you can see here what he described as malum coxa senilis is really a femoral stabber impingement that led to arthritis. And interestingly, he goes in there, removes the acetabular overcoverage, removes the femoral overcoverage, and uh, alleviates the symptoms. Pistol grip deformity that David Scalco and uh, Bill Harris described is also a type of femoral stabber impingement. Femoral stabber impingement has a triad of alpha angle, labral tear, and chondral injury. And alpha angle, as you can see, is measured on these uh, radial views on the MRI or even on the AP view on the hip. And that's where it leads to labral tear and possibly underlying chondral lesion. Numerous uh, uh, pathologies lead to uh, labral tear, includes uh, skiffy and dysplasia in particular, as we've talked about. When you deal with a patient that has femoral stabrum impingement, you have two choices. One is the non-operative measures, which I think is the best approach for these patients. That includes anti-inflammatories, activity modification, weight loss, et cetera. If they fail, then you can consider doing surgical dislocation uh, and or arthroscopy. And I think in the recent years, obviously, arthroscopy has become, for the most part, the standard in dealing with these. But you have to remember that anytime you see a labral tear, you need to look for other hip pathologies. And some of these patients have dysplasia, and the solution for them is redirectional osteotomy. Now, femoral neck osteoplasty is one of the uh, uh, most important aspects of dealing with these, particularly with the cam impingement. And of course, you also want to deal on the astabular side and remove the astabular overcoverage. In the beginning, when this condition was described, surgical dislocation was the surgical procedure of choice. That has been fortunately abandoned for the most part because it involves huge morbidity and there is no need to uh, dislocate the hip in these patients. And the result of even hip dislocation in the hands of master surgeons like Professor Gans was far from ideal. As you can see here, only 74% relief and 20% needed reoperation, 10% had advanced arthritis, 
needing to have hip replacement. So it wasn't ideal. And then there's, of course, the hip arthroscopy. It has its own limits. It's confined space, and it needs to be done by skilled uh, uh, arthroscopists because it leads to uh, major issues like traction injuries and uh, chondral injury during the uh, surgery, etc. And you can't really address the rim pathology for the most part with arthroscopy. And then there are other problems. I've been an advocate of mini open anterior approach. I started doing this in the cadavers and we've done this over time. Labrum is very nicely visible through the anterior approach and you can easily uh, repair the labrum through that uh, particular surgical approach. Um, um, for some reason, my uh, video was not playing. Um, I assume you can see the video still. So usually do this through small incision. Brian, can you see the video? No, we cannot see. Oh. Maybe you can stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll start again, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. So with this, we basically do it through small incision. TFL is retracted uh, laterally, sartorius medially. We then retract the rectus medially, and then extracapsularly we expose the uh, hip. Jot, uh, there's a problem with the video. It's not there, going well. It's not running. Not it's not, you're not seeing it? We are seeing, but it's not working now. Yeah, it's okay now. It's fine. Perfect. And then we retract the rectus medially. The light source goes there. And then we have, that's, uh, the capsule then gets exposed and then um, we remove the pericapsular fat. Now is the capsule and we actually do an I-shaped capsulotomy. We open the capsule with knife. And then the labrum gets exposed. Now you can see the, uh, these remove the retractors to make them intraarticular. And now you see the labrum very nicely. Um, so, um, Hopefully you'll be able to see this. No. And this video is not playing. But you can then uh, remove that bump like there and restore the, um, restore the alpha angle back to normal. Um, and in conditions like this, where there's like over coverage of the femoral head with massive labral ossification, you can still do these through anterior approach. And you can put the patient in yeah. figure of four and able to get behind the labrum, remove the ossification. Joe, jo, jo, yeah. I am in, interrupting you. We yes. cannot see the uh, presentation. Uh, it's better, yeah, yes, yeah. Can you repeat it, please? I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Now we are seeing posterior impingement, yeah. So I was showing you this right yes. here. Yes. And now you can see this is the labral ossification and you can remove that by removing the ossification. Surgery is done as a day case. They go home. Maybe rarely they stay overnight. 
We give them oral analgesics, seven days of cane and crutches, six weeks of hip precaution, preventing deep flexion. And then they start range of motion strengthening uh, starting around, around week two. I've done over 1,100 of these cases. I started in 2005. Surgery takes around roughly 30 to 40 minutes. And we repair the labrum in majority of these cases. When the labrum is not repairable and the patient has severe, uh, a, a patient is young, in those patients, I do labral transplant. Initially, I was raising these through semitendinosus, but now I use cadaveric uh, uh, ligaments. And these patients uh, usually are followed up on a prospective basis. And if you describe patient satisfaction as return to sports, pain relief, return to prior employment, no analgesics and fully functional, we had 82% excellent to very good results, 8.1% conversion to total hip. And here's the spider diagram. If you look at it, you will see that patients definitely have an improvement in function uh, following the surgical procedure um, with return to function a majority of these patients. I've learned some lessons over the last 15 years. First of all is that labral tear is very common and not every labral tear, tear needs a surgical uh, intervention. If you look at this study, labral tear were very common in asymptomatic patients in the contralateral hip as well. And the incidence was about 41% in asymptomatic hips. Another study we did in the past showed about 20 to 25% of patients with no hip symptoms had a labral tear. The second lesson I've learned is that not everybody does well with the surgical procedure. If you look at the all commerce success, in my hands at least, the success around 79%, clearly far from ideal. But that included patients with post-traumatic FAI, SCIFI, PERTES, and, uh, and borderline DDH. What does influence the outcome is the degree of arthritis at the time of presentation. And if the joint space is less than three millimeters, that really leads to early arthritis. When you remove the labrum versus repairing it, that also results in a, a less success. Patients who have workers' compensations, legal cases pending, et cetera, and then another finding was a prior surgery, particularly arthroscopy, compromised the outcome on these patients. I've found that athletes do really well. Here is another paper on my series published, shows 97% success in athletes, either collegiate, professional, or semi-professional athletes. So uh, arthroscopy series majority are on athletes, and then you can see why these patients do well. They are motivated, incentivized, they want to get back to activities, and because of that, they do well. Surgery is not for all. It is for patients who have classical symptoms, in particular their triad, uh, patients uh, that get relief from intraarticular injection uh, during a MAR arthrogram. It is not for patients who have pain out of proportion to pathology, when the pathology doesn't fit the uh, symptoms, when there is a missing triad, and when there is no relief from intraarticular injection. Uh, not patients, patients with psychological issues, workers' compensation, et cetera, they don't do well. Again, in all commerce, success is 79%. Athletes, 97%, the other way around. And these patients do well. So that's the subject of um, um, FAI that I wanted to cover. Then I want to actually talk a little bit about um, total hip and dysplastic. And if time allows, we can talk about uh, periastabular osteotomy also. Is that okay with you, Ibrahim Fateh? No. <laughs> There's a problem with the videos. There is. Okay. Let me go to a different... Um... Let's try this. Um, I'm going to bring this up. Um, and I think it should work with this one. Um, 
let me go to okay let's see if this works yeah can you see it yes it's okay okay perfect all right so let's go to i'm going to talk about direct anterior approach to the hip why do i use it because it's easy to set up patient is on their post uh they're on supine position as you can see very quickly you can put the patient on the table and and then you have access to their uh, malleoli and uh, you're able to assess the limb length it's faster recovery if your um, waiting room looks like this with all elderly in wheelchairs i don't think direct anterior will make much of a difference and then i did a, a randomized prospective study of my own patient 100 through da 100 through direct lateral approach and we looked at the various outcome parameters and as you can see from here time to get up and go chair test lower extremity functional recovery return to work and driving all of them was superior in patients who had DA versus direct lateral. And there have been some uh, other studies showing uh, this the same for postrolateral approach. This is one of my patients three weeks out from surgery. And she sends me these uh, pictures, a little worrisome, but patients start to uh, get active very quickly. There are some fallacies result related to direct anterior total hip. Uh, first is that these patients need a special table fluoroscopy. That's not true. You can actually do these on a regular operating table and you don't need too much of a specialized instrumentation, but you do need to have some of these uh, instruments like the curved uh, retractors that will allow you to go around the uh, uh, femoral neck. We need a sharp light source and a sharp homan that will then retract the rectus. As you can see, these are some of the specialized instruments that need to be available during surgery. And then this is uh, what I call double footed. This is for uh, elevation of the femur in order to get access into the uh, femoral canal. Uh, so the, there are some specialized instrumentations that you need to have. And some surgeons prefer to have these offset handles for the socket, but you definitely need to have an offset handle for the brooch. It's, there is a learning curve associated with it. I think the first 50 cases, it is not for surgeons who have a lot of volume. It is not for every patient, as you can imagine. Um, incision is in the groin, so it can be an issue for some of these patients with a panis and uh, they are obese. I usually use these occlusive dressings and keep them on for seven days to try to prevent any wound related problems. Um, people say it's not extensile. That's not true at all. It can be extensile. Um, it needs to be done uh, under regional anesthesia. General anesthetics is not perfect. Um, and you can definitely do this for any patients that has the problems. Um, and I have no idea why this video is not, videos are not playing. I checked them this morning, everything was playing. And of course now on the... Uh... No problem, we can imagine. <laughs> uh... Yes, it's running. Yeah, this one is running. So patient positioning is actually uh, perfect. Um, usually put the incision anteriorly, as you can see here. Uh, this patient actually already had, so this is total hip through direct anterior approach for a patient that needed bone grafting on the astabulum. I haven't shown this video before, Ibrahim. I thought that your uh, attendees may like to see it. Uh, yeah, this is the first. But we will use the same incision as the patient has had for prior osteotomy. Um, so we make the incision through the front. Uh, it is about two centimeters inferior to anterior superior iliac spine, and it goes right um, over the tensor fascia lata. Usually try to make it small. We get uh, coagulation. Uh, try to gain access to the tensor fascia lata. Then we divide the perimyceum over TFL. 
and then we get down to so the tensor fascial arts has retracted laterally rectus is retracted medially uh, we have that uh, light source right above that's the capsule and now we are opening the capsule in an i-shaped fashion uh, which then gives us access into the hip uh, in a second you will see better i apologize if it's not very good view so now we move those retractor uh, medially um, so these retractors are moved intra-articularly. So here is the head, here is the leg. That's medial, that's lateral. And now, and uh, you can remove the, we then use a corkscrew to remove the femoral head. And this patient has severe dysplasia. We remove the femoral head. And once the femoral head is removed, we will um, access the acetabulum. Okay, now you can visualize that. Yep. So, There's the head is removed. Once the head is removed, you can very easily see the acetabulum right there. And you can see the acetabulum is very dysplastic, severe superior deficiency. And then we start to ream. Um, we remove any type of soft tissues that are, that's actually a little bit of, uh, um, we remove all the, um, um, and then I use a curette to get to the superior part of the acetabulum to try to remove the uh, articular cartilage, remaining articular cartilage. So that's the part that we have reamed. And that's the superficial part at the top. And we will then we will then utilize the bone graph. I use a straight reamer for these cases. So now that we have the straight reamer. And we leave that reamer in place. And here is the deficiency superiorly. So we will use the, um, the bone graft and try to cover the superior part right there with the bone graft. So I prepare the bone graft in the back table, usually in a sort of a lemon wedge shape, measuring what that area looks like. And once we prepare the, um, um, once we prepare that, that looks like this. Then we bring it and put it right above the the reamer that's left in place. right there that fits beautifully in that area and then we will use some um, retract uh, use yeah so we will actually impact that into that spot and then we will use a couple of um, screws to try to fix it so there it is it sits and those screws go 
in once the screws are in. Again, you keep the reamer in place to prevent that that uh, that graft being too big. I usually leave one gram, one drill bit in another K wire, and then run the screws. Once this is done with two screws, then we impact the acetabular components in place. And I measure these with depth gauge. Put the screws in. Acetabular component goes in. Again, I use a straight uh, handle for my acetabular components also. And once that's in, you can impact that. The beauty of this supi uh, supine position is you can decide exactly where the acetabular component is going to be because malposition in the acetabular component is actually very difficult in these patients. You can't even malposition if you wanted to. But you just have to be a little careful about the version because there's a tendency for the femur to push the acetabular component into too much antiversion. And then you put screws into the acetabulum, that's done. Uh, liner, then femur and all that, which I don't think uh, you need to see with the bone hook, we are elevating the femur. You can see we're going around the bone to be able to elevate the femur. So the leg is externally rotated to expose. Now we have reduced it. And then the, um, the stem goes in and the rest of it is history. And here we have the final reduction, testing uh, for stability, extreme flexion, internal and external rotation, figure of four, external rotation with extension, which is that's when they usually dislocate through the direct anterior approach. And here, uh, that's what it looks like. The bone graft is there, and then that's the acetabular component. And then the patient walks very well. That's the patient that uh, we couldn't see earlier. Um, okay. Now I want to tell you a little bit about infection, if that's okay, Brian. Do I have yes, time yes. to we'll talk about infection? Yes, yes, no problem. Thank you. We'll be happy. It's not easy to find anything. I would like to talk to you about one stage exchange or infection overall. Um, I think one stage exchange is actually gaining uh, traction in the United States, thanks to works of Thorsten Gerke that's really brought uh, attention to this issue. Um, one thing that we have found is that it can be performed with uncemented components. Um, and there is really no difference. I personally believe the main uh, determinant of success is surgical debridement and not necessarily the cement with antibiotics. Obviously, two-stage reimplantation still remains the most popular option, yeah, but I wouldn't say it's the gold standard. Nothing is gold standard because the success is so terrible. Success of two-stage exchanges in 70 to 80% range, as you can see from this particular study we published, is about 72% success. And the success depends on how you define it. No clinical failure, no recurrence, no reoperation, no death. These patients usually have um, about 70 to 80% success. Part of the reason for that reduced success is that we found that 11% of patients who undergo resection arthroplasty, they never get reimplanted. And then five to 10% of these patients die between the first and the second stage. And unrelated deaths are usually not unrelated. They die of anemia, arrhythmia, cardiac issues, because they endure such massive physiological insult during the operation. So I would say these are all mostly related deaths. And then this, uh, the success and survivorship is really terrible. The other issue is that the outcome in terms of function is not really that fantastic. Some of these patients are unhappy. This is Guo Li's work from uh, University of Pennsylvania showing that about 39% were unhappy with their function. 
but they don't want to complain because they're worried about the surgeons taking back to the operating room. So an ability to really pr deliver great results in these patients should make us want to think about other options. And other options, unfortunately, can be a, um, a amputation in the long run if we don't address the problem. So water stage exchange obviously is a great option because it's one surgical procedure, shorter overall recovery, decreased expense, and I don't think the results are inferior. It's perfect for elderly patients who are unable to tolerate multiple procedures. When the organism is favorable and there is an antibiotic against them, um, and I think the results in the hands of the uh, good surgeons is pretty similar to two-stage exchange. And these are some of the European series that were published, you know, 100% infection-free in one stage group. And uh, I think these patients can do very well based on expense and uh, impact on quality of life. One stage exchange is so much better as you can see from this Markov's uh, analysis. And if you combine the um, one stage exchange with delivery of local antibiotics, either through allografts that are impregnated with antibiotics, as um, Heinz Winkler has talked about, then the success rate can go all the way up to 90, 95%. We need a randomized perspective study. It is actually uh, ongoing in United Kingdom and United States. Uh, Tom Faring from uh, Ortho Carolina is leading that effort. And I think the future needs to be different. We need to actually have better antibiotics. We need to have immune enhancing strategies such as uh, vaccines and other types of antimicrobial peptides. We need to be able to eradicate the biofilm by having biofilm <coughs> eradication uh, uh, methods for these patients. So I think the future is going to be different. And in my opinion, a lot of these patients will most likely be candidates for one stage exchange. I will stop here, uh, Ibrahim, if it's okay with you, because um, I've taken so much time and I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much for perfect talk again. And we have some questions, if you don't mind. Uh, let's start with the questions from the audience. Uh, first, Okan from Okan, Tezgel. Uh, preparing the femur is the most important step in DHA in total lip arthroplasty. In this respect, which type of anesthesia do you prefer for DAA in young muscular male patients? Uh, I think uh, he's asking about the, his uh, question marks in his brain about the problems with the uh, spinal anesthesia uh, without uh, muscle relaxation. Yeah, so we usually uh, use spinal anesthetics. We uh, give a long-acting uh, uh, local anesthetic like bupivacaine. We don't... Um, uh, like general anesthetics, usually, especially in the younger males, because they are very, very difficult to uh, expose the femur in. So spinal anesthetics, if you can, and we have not been using opioids in the spinal anesthetics for the past uh, decade or so. Sorry, Brian, I'm not sure if I can hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, is there an indication for hip arthroscopy in a 40 years of old patient with a tennis stage three osteoarthritis? Absolutely not. No. No. None. Okay. Any exception? Uh, not really. And it's not the 40 year old, but uh, tonus three arthritis, I don't think you can really do much with a scope. A scope is going to work for two months and patient is going to come back. What about the osteotomy? 40 years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would do osteotomy if they have good joint space, if they have good range of motion, and if the joint is congruent. Yeah, absolutely. Not a problem. I mean, 40 is not that old, especially as we age, you know, 40 looks uh, younger and younger every day. 
So no, I would do it in uh, the 40 year old for sure. What what is your uh, opinion about uh, uh, limits for the arthroplasty and osteotomy for the in terms of the age and in terms of the level of the dysplasia? Yeah, so any patient that has good joint space, good joint space being defined as three millimeters or more, and they have a congruent joint, Uh, when in the abduction view with neutral rotation, the femoral head comes in, they don't have excessive, excessive uh, uh, uh, coxa valga. They have good range of motion. Their motion is not restricted. And they are under 40, 45. I think those are good candidates for osteotomy. If they are older than 45, if they have some degree of arthritis, non-congruent joint, or range of motion is limited, I think they should undergo arthroplasty. Okay. Uh, what's your idea about direct anterior push in robotics? I have not had any experience with robotics. Why? Uh, uh, for multiple reasons. One is I'm not quite sure what problem robotics is trying to address. Uh, I think mostly is marketing right now. Uh, they're talking about better component positioning. Um, it's hard to beat uh, the component positioning. My dislocation rate is one every three years. I will see one dislocation. I doubt very much that uh, robotics is going to make much of a difference to that. Adds to operative time, adds to expense. You need a CT scan. You have to put extra pins adds to cost of uh, delivery of care. And right now I'm not quite sure if that is uh, worthwhile. Now, if data emerges, and I haven't seen any yet, but if good data emerges and we have fantastic data that shows robotics improves patient care, I'll be happy to start learning about robotics. But right now, in my opinion, I think robotics is purely marketing. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would like to ask about uh, another question about the robotic. Uh, for the young patients, like 40 years old, 30 years old, even even 20 years old, we sometimes we had have, have to uh, do this operation. And uh, does it cost? Does that then an idiom in Turkish? You know that attığımız taşın ürküttüğümüz kurbağalara değmesi. Let me try to translate to English. Does it cost? To to throw the truck <laughs> to the, uh, to the uh, number of the frogs that we have scared. <laughs> Oldu mu? <laughs> Is it okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Uh, <laughs> uh, great expression. You know, I don't know... Uh, I, I just don't know what exactly robotics are trying to address right now. And if somebody could educate me on the value of robotics, uh, young or old, doesn't matter, I can see why it would have a better uh, value in the younger patients, but I, I just don't see their value right now. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Bülent Tatilla. And uh, he's asking that what's the significance of the femoral version anomalies in early hip arthritis? And what yeah. are the indications to correct existing femoral retroversion? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Bolent. The, the femoral version actually is a very important pathology that has been ignored for the most part. And it's been ignored, one, because we didn't understand it, and two, is because it's very difficult to measure the version of the femur. It requires very sophisticated cross-sectional imaging. But as we look at the hip and as we see more and more of these pathologies being described, we're finding that the version of the femur plays a very critical role in instability, in symptoms, and definitely in development of arthritis. So I look at the femoral version, usually try to do that on these uh, frog-like lateral views and if the version of the femur is such that it's going to compromise the results of the osteotomy, I sometimes do derotational osteotomy of the femur, particularly the retroverted femur. As Bullen said, that's really a major problem. 
but you also have to remember the version of the femur when you were doing a total hip replacement, because uh, you have to may you may have to adjust the position of the acetabulum to compensate for the abnormal version on the femoral side. Usually with dysplastics, they are excessively antiverted. So I tend to put the uh, socket in less of antiversion, so the combined version is better. Um, uh, that, so th that's absolutely very, very important question to ask. And I think we do need to pay more attention to the version of the femur. Okay. Uh, do you change the uh, anteversion for the direct anterior in uh, comparing to posterior for the femur and acetabulum? No. It's a little bit like combined anteversion. What's your combined anteversion for direct okay. anterior? About uh, 15 to 20 degrees. Totally. Uh, what I do find is on some of these dysplastic hips, that they have excessive antiversion on the socket. When you're putting the acetabular component, you end up seeing that the anterior wall of the acetabulum, acetabular component is exposed. And those, those patients could run into iliopsoas problem. So what I do in those patients is try to leave it in as, late, as least, um, uh, in, a, in a little bit more antiversion than I would do. And then I use those elevated liners in the front to try to compensate for that combined version. Okay, there is another question about robotics from Abdullah Kush. Uh, also, I would like to uh, get the idea of the opinion of the uh, Frankos. He's he's here also, and uh, he's asking that: Do you think the same way for the robots in total knee as for total hip? For I'll you or Franco? Yeah, I'll I'll say something and then I'll have Franco weigh in. Um, if there is going to be a role for robotics, I think it would be in unicondylar knee replacement and in total knee. Why? Because we don't understand the knee as well as we understand the hip. And two, with all due respect to Franco, knees don't do as well as the hips do. So there is room for improvement on the knee side, not so much on the hip. So if we can understand what those issues are, and if robot can lend itself to addressing those issues, yes, I'm more open to the idea of robots in the knees than in the hips. If I can but, say one word. Yes, yes, of course, please. Do, of course, I fully agree with, with Jay. I think that uh, the advantages I found I find in the in the totally arthroplasty with robot is that I can control step by step. Uh, all my procedure, I can plan exactly, and uh, the big advantages in the robot I'm using uh, that uh, they are completely imageless. So I don't need an extra CT scan as uh, it is necessary with some robots, or even the hips. And uh, I fully agree that the rate of success in the knee is not as good as in the hip. So we need to improve that. I see the robotic uh, surgery not as a success of my personal success because I've been lucky to be in the place where uh, we have three robots, but only because I feel a commitment, a duty in using the robot to make this technology easier, cheaper, more available for the surgeons. And so it's a commitment we have, it's a burden we have, it's not a, a, a, an occasion to, to be on the stage because we are successful, but only because uh, we really need to improve this technology. And uh, I'm sure that uh, this technology will, be, will bring something new for, our, for us and for the patients. So I fully agree with, uh, with, uh, with Jay. There is a strong uh, marketing uh, uh, maneuver and, uh, from the companies, but uh, if we take a good part of robotics, we can uh, really do something for our patients. Okay, thank you. And there's a question from Suha Aktaş. Do you consider that DAA is with a steep learning curve in the compression with PLA? Yes, it is much, much more uh, difficult than doing postrolateral approach. And yeah, the, um, the learning curve, I think, is uh, steeper for sure. Okay. To, get to overcome that learning curve, I'm sorry, Brian, there's three things that the surgeon should do, in my opinion. Number one is go out and do the case, do your first view in a cadaver um, and not in real patient. 
and two, go and observe a surgeon that does DAA and learn from them. In particular, learn how they elevate the femur and how they uh, also have specialized instrumentation. And then three is when you start, start with easy patients first. Don't try to do this on everybody. Do the easy patients first and then get up to that point. Again, my opinion is if you're not doing at least 50 to 70 cases of hips per year, you shouldn't really change your approach. You'll never get over that learning curve. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, thank you, please. Uh, we have started uh, the anterior approach with the patient uh, on the lateral side and not on the supine position because you can find the, uh, the, the acetabulum in the same position as a posterior lateral approach. And uh, uh, I followed exactly the suggestion of Jay. Uh, Cadaver first, easy case, and uh, I have learned from another, from another surgeon. So the uh, anterior approach with the patient lying on the lateral side, uh, it's a little bit easier than the direct anterior approach with the patient in supine position without the traction table. I do not do any revision surgery in the hip with this uh, direct anterior approach. And the other thing that uh, uh, we, we only use some uh, specific stems for this uh, anterior approach with a, a no shoulder. So I do not cement uh, with the uh, uh, anterior approach. I do not use uh, uh, uh, stems with a big shoulder in the anterior approach. So uh, for me, it may bring some advantages for the patient, some disadvantages for the surgeon because the learning curve is not easy. And the, uh, major, the biggest limitation is the fact that not all stems designs can be used with the anterior approach. Okay. Another question, maybe both you can answer the, this question from Jamal Burak Demirkram. C-on-C ceramic is preferred in young patients by some centers, although biomechanical studies show that wear is less. It is not clinically important. What's your preference? Ceramic on ceramic. I um, used a lot of ceramic and ceramic. Um, I think I've done over three, 400 of those. And the only ceramic and ceramic that was available in the United States up until recently was the Biolux Forte. And I had problems. I saw at least three or four fractures. I saw quite a few squeaking. So I stopped the use of the Biolux Forte. And then the Biolux Delta became available, but only one manufacturer uh, provides it in the United States. And I don't happen to use their implants, that manufacturer's implants. So I can't really switch using their implants for a ceramic and ceramic on everybody. So what I have done in the very, very young, and by very young, I mean patients under age of 30. I go to Shriners Hospital here. There are so many patients with AVN and dysplasia, et cetera. In those patients, I use this ceramic and ceramic Biolux Delta. So I think in that group of patients, it's justified, but I don't use it on, um, on everyone. May I add, a, add another question related to ceramic and ceramic? Uh, what do you think about uh, uh, uh, squeaking for the future, especially if we see the squeaking in, in especially at the um, second decade after the operations? And uh, the uh, breakage of the, especially limb of the uh, ceramic liner. If you put the ceramic component a little bit, uh, a little, uh, not horizontally, uh, we have to be perfect. Yes. Otherwise, uh, we will see some problems, especially in the, after the uh, uh, 10 years. Absolutely. Yeah. So vertical inclination of a socket in patients who have a hard on hard bearing surface leads to the problem of squeaking in ceramics, leads to problem of possible fracture and also increases the likelihood of dislocation. Completely agree, Brian. In these patients, I, I, I always like to put these, especially in the younger patients in much more horizontal position. Absolutely. Okay, what do you think about Franco? 
uh, it's so true issue. that uh, the cross-linked uh, modern polyethylene, uh, which comes in very thin uh, design because of the low wear they present, uh, they present exactly the same problem. If the socket is placed in a very steep position, you can may have a chipping of the of the uh, of the of the liner, uh, no matter if it's a polyethylene or ceramic. And within ceramic, you have an avalanche effect. I've been lucky of being the possibility of using Delta uh, ceramic on ceramic bearing. So I've been using a little bit more number in cases of uh, compared to, to J. Uh, the issue is not uh, the uh, fracture, uh, rupture of the ceramic. The issue could be the squeaking. And so I stopped using that uh, with the 30, 40 uh, millimeters diameter head. I stopped to 36. But in a young patient, that's my, my, my preferred choice, ceramic on ceramic bearing. Okay. There's a question from Aydan, from uh, Azerbaijan, Aydan Gahramanov. How do you feel about the use of cementless stem in elderly patients? Yeah, I think uh, it's okay to use it in the elderly patients, but it is better to lean more towards cement to the stem in those patients, uh, because I think the cementless stem in the elderly has a higher complication rate, both in terms of aseptic loosening and also incidence of periprosthetic fracture. So if they are really old, and if, they, um, if it's type B or C, door type B or C bone, I lean more towards cement. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, first question is about micro stems, especially in younger patients. What do you think about uh, shorter stems? Yeah, thank you, Fatih. I think short stems uh, are not all the same. Some short stems have fantastic track record and they have done very well. And those are great to use because it uh, prevents you from violating too much of the diaphyseal bone. But not every short stem is the same. And then the second thing that you have to remember is that short stems are a little, from technical point of view, a little harder to put in. And you shouldn't be the one that's doing like one short stem once a month. If you're going to be using short stem, you should probably be using short stem on just about everybody in order to become very, very proficient. I don't want to mention any names of stems but two or three European short stems have had fantastic track record. Uh, one or two um, American short stems have had terrible track record. So if you're gonna be using a short stem, make sure you know about their track record before, before you start to use them. Thank you. Thank you. Despite preoperative templating, sometimes you must decide interoperatively between two decisions, leg length discrepancy or stability. In these cases, do you have any additional plan? And uh, secondly, have you performed trochanteric advancement osteotomy in this situation? Yeah, great question again. Uh, first of all, I'll tell of you that obviously, obviously stability trumps limb length, but in an ideal world, you don't want to lengthen somebody in an effort uh, to gain stability. If you're in a situation where you find that you are lengthening someone to get stability, do very careful review of the components. Because usually in that circumstance, the components are not optimally positioned. Your socket may be retroverted. Your, it may be too vertical. Something is going on. If after scrutinizing the component positioning and looking at it very, very carefully, you still find that you are unstable, then you have a couple of options. One is to switch to a bigger head, potentially switch to dual mobility construct that makes them more stable, or you can advance the greater trochanter in patients with perthes when they're having a bone on bone impingement, for example, or because the abductor mechanism is so flaccid. Yes, I have done that, but it's very rare. Another question from Fatih, yes. Yes, uh, I would like to ask you uh, about dysplastic hips. Uh, in some patients, uh, distal femoral valgus deformity 
uh, or rotational deformities uh, accompanied to uh, hip dislocation. Uh, do you recommend uh, deformity correction, uh, distal femoral osteotomy, or in which situations you make osteotomy? So, so is this pelvic osteotomy or femoral osteotomy? Femoral osteotomy, distal femoral osteotomy for correction of the valgus deformity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If you have got a patient with severe valgus deformity of the knee and they have good joint space or fairly decent joint space, I think it's a fantastic operation. And by severe deformity, I mean anyone beyond 20 degrees. And they have to be young. They have to be young for me to do distal femoral osteotomy. Okay. Uh, and uh, do you prefer single stage bilateral total lip arthroplasty for bilateral coxal arthrosis in young patients? Is DAA advantages in this situation? Yeah, absolutely. That's another advantage of DAA. Uh, you can have the patient under spinal anesthesia. Each side takes about 45 minutes to one hour. You can do the procedure. You can prep the legs, both legs, into the field. So you don't have to flip the patient. And it's a fantastic operation. I've done that on hundreds of patients. Yes, that's my preference. Okay. There is a question from Genghis Shen. Uh, especially the question uh, for the uh, Franco, but he has to he had to leave now, and uh, I will ask this question to you. And uh, in especially in stiff knees with excessive deformed uh, alignment, what do you do? TT osteotomy or rectus snape? I always start by doing extensive soft tissue releases of the gutters removing scar tissues. And then my next approach is to do a SNP. And most of the time, most being 99% of the time, that's enough. If at that point I'm still struggling and I cannot get into the knee, I have two choices. One is to do this colostiotomy. The second would be the patellar peel, the banana peel technique that Aaron Hoffman described. I have been leaning more towards the patellar peel than doing tibial tubercle osteotomy. Because as soon as you uh, touch the tibia, uh, the two, uh, it, it's, it makes a, a huge difference. Now, that's for primaries with severe deformity, which I think that's what uh, Chengiz was asking. But sometimes in reimplantation or revision surgeries, I have done tubule tubercle osteotomy right in the beginning because I knew that, that without it, we would not be able to do the surgery at all. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I think these are the old questions and you are tight. And uh, we always appreciate to you uh, for your all your help to uh, our clinic and our country also, our uh, uh -huh. Turkish Orthopedics uh, Society. And uh, we will be happy uh, to see you in as soon as possible. Inshallah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Very, thank you very much, Ibrahim. And thank, thank you, all my friends. Thank you. Iyi günler. And uh, iyi akşamlar. It's, uh, it's evet. Very, <laughs> very uh, herkesin selam var hocam. Burada. İyi akşamlar. İyi akşamlar. Hepsiye selam yeterim. Çok çok sağ olun. Sağ olasın. Görüşmek evet. üzere. Merhaba. Selamlar. Görüşmek. Sağ olasın. Sağ olasın.